cross-section of the hull of a modern steamer. 1. Vertical keel, 2. Floor, 3. Stringer, 4. Longitudinal stiffeners, 5. Extreme double bottom sheet, 6. Side keel, 7. Frame, 8. Bottom lining, 9. Nitsa, 10. Beams, 11. Lower deck, 12. Upper deck, 13. Wooden flooring, 14. Mine cargo hatch, 15. Hatch combing, 16. Carlings, 17. Transverse bulkhead, 18. Pillars, 19. Flooring of the second, inner, bottom, 20. Side skin, 21. Bulwark, 22. Gunnel. It consists of a steel shell that does not allow water to enter the vessel, and a skeleton that reinforces the shell. The steel shell of the vessel is the outer skin, as well as the deck deck. It is not easy to tightly fit the skeleton with sheathing. After all, the length of the ships reaches 300 meters, and the width, 35. The thickness of the skin is 20 or more millimeters. Therefore, the outer skin and decking are made not from one panel, but from many separate sheets. Each row of sheets along the length of the vessel is called a belt or belt. Each belt of the outer skin has its own name, a horizontal keel, bottom, cheekbone, side, and the upper belt, near the upper deck, is called a shear strake. True, there is also a belt above the shear strake, a bulwark, but it is much thinner than the rest of the skin belts, and its purpose is completely different, or without a bulwark, both people and objects on the open deck would have had a bad time. They would have been washed overboard by the oncoming wave. The deck decks, as well as the outer skin, stretch along the vessel in parallel belts. Sometimes steel flooring is covered with wood on top so that the foot does not slip. The skeleton of the vessel is formed by the so-called hull set. The main part of the set is the vertical keel. This is a long and high strip, based on a horizontal keel. It is welded from separate sheets and runs vertically along the entire length of the vessel. At the ends of the vessel, strong inclined bars made of cast and forged steel are attached to the vertical keel. The bow bar is the stem, and the stern bar is the stern. On both sides of the vertical keel there are several similar longitudinal strips, but they are of smaller thickness and length. These are bottom stringers. And across the vessel installed flora. The bottom stringers, floors and vertical keel carry a solid steel flooring, the inner bottom. This flooring, like the deck, consists of longitudinal belts. And between it and the outer skin of the bottom, a double bottom space is formed. Some of the bottom stringers and floors have holes to lighten the weight and allow a person to climb through. The other part is without holes. Thus, the entire double bottom space is divided into many isolated compartments. These compartments store fuel for boilers, lubricating oil, fresh water, ballast water. The continuation of the floors above the inner bottom are often spaced transverse ribs, frames. On them and impose sheets of side skin. The frames along the length of the vessel are fastened with powerful longitudinal beams, which are called side stringers. According to the height of the side, two, three and even four side stringers are placed. The upper ends of the frames across the vessel, from side to side, are connected by horizontal beams, beams. On the beams, like a floor on an interfloor overlap, steel deck decks are laid. And the beams are fastened with longitudinal horizontal ribs, carlings, which in turn are supported by vertical racks, pillars. An important part of the ship's hull are transverse bulkheads. There are rules that provide for a certain number and order of bulkheads, depending on the size of the vessel and what it is intended for. The design of the bulkhead is quite simple, it is a panel reinforced with vertical and horizontal ribs, racks. When designing a hull, designers make sure that its strength is not excessive, and the dimensions of the parts are not too large. Indeed, in this case, the hull will be weighted and the ship, in order to maintain the same displacement, will have to take less payload. Therefore, on the contrary, there is a struggle to lighten the body. The use of the highest quality steel can help in this. Such steel increases the strength of hull structures without increasing their size, and hence weight. After the design of the vessel, working drawings are made. According to these drawings, parts of the hull, mechanisms and various devices of the vessel are processed and then assembled into one hull in the workshops of various factories. Long months, and even years of hard work on the project were left behind. The exact dimensions of all parts of the future vessel, the displacement, the power of its mechanisms, the required amount of materials and equipment have become known. Calculations found all the qualities of the future ship, necessary for him to sail safely. The project is ready. 
The ship originated on paper in the form of lines and numbers, in the form of thick books of mathematical calculations and hundreds, if not thousands of drawings. It's time to start building it at the factory. Ship building started. Every steamship undergoes three particularly important events during its construction. This is a bookmark, launching from the slipway into the water and hoisting the flag. There are different periods of time between these events. It all depends on the size of the ship. In large ones, each interval lasts for many months. For small ones, only a few weeks pass from the laying of the flag to the hoisting of the flag. The bookmark is made when the hull begins to be assembled on the slipway. A plate is fixed inside the hull, on which the engraver wrote, where and when the ship was laid down and what it was called. Sometimes the laying ceremony is arranged very solemnly, workers and employees gather on the slipway, invited guests come, speeches are made, music plays. This ceremony, as it were, marks the beginning of the construction of the ship. But in fact, construction begins long before the laying. The construction of a new ship begins when a theoretical drawing of the ship arrives at the plant and the workers floating workers begin to lay out its hull on the plaza. The plaza is a huge hull 200 to 300 meters long. It is always located on the top floor of a large workshop. This is done so that daylight well illuminates the floor of the plaza through the glass roof. The floor is made of smooth boards tightly fitted to each other and covered with light grey oil paint. It turns out like a slate board, but of such dimensions that sports competitions can be arranged on it. On this floor, according to a theoretical drawing, all the outlines of the body are applied in their actual size. This is called the breakdown of the ship's hull on the plaza. Here, as it were, a giant pattern of the entire hull of the ship is created. According to it, then separate patterns are made for each part of the body. Such patterns are long slats and patterns knocked together from plywood or thin boards. Often they make, as in sewing a suit, paper patterns. Paper patterns are sketches taken from the layout. The cutting of parts according to such patterns is performed below, in the whole processing shop. Let's go there and see how it's done. Here, a scriber with a crane laid a large steel sheet on the table. Then he looks at the sketch lying in front of him and, using a meter and a compass, confidently transfers the contour lines of the part to the sheet or, having applied the template, simply circles it with a sharp steel scriber. An assistant marker with light blows of a hammer on a rod pointed at the bottom, a core, makes these lines distinct and permanently preserved. Each detail marked with such dotted lines goes further into the processing area. The plaza is an expensive building. In addition, a lot of highly qualified markers have been employed for a long time on the layout of the hull and the marking of parts. All this forced shipbuilders to look for a new, more advanced way of cutting hull parts. And they found a way. It is called photo-optical markup of parts. Do you want to know what it is? Imagine a projection lamp, the rays of which are directed at a steel sheet prepared for marking. This method is called photo-optical marking. The negative of the photograph of the detail drawing is inserted into the lantern. And on the sheet with the required magnification, light lines for cutting the part are clearly projected. It remains to direct them with stable paint or fill them with a core point. And even an inexperienced worker can do such work. You don't even need a plaza. The negatives of the photographs are provided by a special agency. The designers of this bureau directly produce template drawings of each part in a reduced form directly from the theoretical and working drawings. Then they are photographed. This method is much cheaper and speeds up the marking of parts by almost three times. The material for the suit is cut after cutting. The same is done with cut sheets of steel used to build the hull. Previously, press scissors were used for this. They cut steel long and inaccurately. Now cut with gas. Most often, gas cutting machines. The most interesting part of such a machine is a magnetic head with a roller. The movement of the roller is transmitted to another important part, the copier. This device moves the cutter so that it cuts the most complex shapes without any preliminary marking on the steel sheet. You just need to have a set of copy shields. A copier shield is a plywood or thin metal sheet to which steel bars are attached, copiers. The arrangement of these bars just corresponds to the contours of the parts. The roller of the magnetic head is pressed against the copiers. Such a device makes the gas cutter, or even several cutters at once, make its amazing journey, exactly repeating the movement of the magnetic head along the bizarre borders of the copiers. A narrow jet of bluish flame erupts from the torch, leaving behind a thin, clean cut in the middle. 
This is how the gas cutting machine works. 1. Bars on a copier template. 2. Magnetic head. 3. Gas cutter. 4. Steel sheet. 5. Cut out details. Now they have come up with an even more amazing machine. There are no bulky copy shields around her anymore. But the cutter still, without the help of a person, cuts out details of various shapes. Who controls his movements? Maybe the invisible man? Nothing like this? To find out, let's go into a small room, not far from the miracle machine. Here on the table is some kind of device resembling a radio receiver. But, unlike a radio receiver, this device has an attached lens, almost the same as that of a camera. The lens looks at the drawing of the part being cut out in front of it and, using a photoelectric copying system, causes the cutter to copy the lines of this drawing on the steel sheet from a distance, and even to the right scale. The accuracy of this machine is just amazing. Its appearance is a merit of Soviet scientists. But it is also remarkable that only a worker with a secondary education can serve it. There are already quite a few such smart machines and such workers in the workshops of the shipyard. However, not every blank cut from steel is a finished part. It sometimes needs to be bent to the shape of the ship's hull. Simple death is done on bending rollers. And there are special machines for bending the ribs of the hull. These are all fairly easy and fast operations. Another thing is when a sheet needs to be given a complex depth, both along and in width. Previously, such bending was done only by hand. First, the sheets were heated to a white heat, and then they were knocked out with heavy hammers on special frames. It was very hard and long work. For its implementation, a whole team of the most experienced and strong benders was required. Now the sheets are cold bent on hydraulic presses. Such a press is located near the gas cutting machine. He is as tall as a two-story house. On its control panel there are a lot of all sorts of pens and devices. In front of the press, a large piston moves up and down. It is called a punch. The punch presses with great force through special dies onto the steel sheet. A few pressings of the punch, and the sheet takes on any complex form of death. The pressure force of some presses reaches 2000 tons. The processed parts are checked by the controller, after which they are handed over to the warehouse. From the warehouse, they, as needed, are sent to the assembly and welding shop. There, they assemble the structures of the ship's hull. As you can see, shipbuilding steel goes through three or four operations before it becomes a finished part. And just 15 years ago, the same piece of steel had to go through 10 to 12 operations. The hull processing shop of the plant was filled to capacity with various machines and presses. Almost all of them existed in order to serve the riveting. There were punching presses and machines for drilling holes in parts for rivets. There were planers for gouging the edges of sheets after a rough cut on press scissors. There were also machines that bent flanges, sides, at the ends of the sheets, again for the density of rivet joints. There were many other rumbling, bulky machines. Now most of them are gone. What happened in shipbuilding? What could eliminate a lot of machine tools, reduce the number of shipbuilding steel processing operations and thereby speed up the construction of steamships? The reason for this was the electric welding of metals, which replaced riveting. Arc wonderful. Of course, the conversation will not be about the arc that is needed to harness the horse. Our arc is very small, no more than 3 to 4 millimeters long. And it serves to connect the individual parts of metal structures. This arc can be seen everywhere, in the estates of machine and tractor stations, during the laying of gas pipelines, in the construction of bridges and steamships. What is this arc? Let's observe the actions of a worker creating such an arc. Just put on glasses with dark glasses so as not to spoil your eyes. Here the worker settled comfortably at the parts fitted to each other. Here he also covered his eyes with a shield with dark glasses, and with his right hand he squeezed the handle with the electrode inserted into it and a thick grey wire from the current source stretches to the electrode, like a snake. The structure to be welded is grounded. It's like an electrical circuit. While the electrode does not touch the product, the circuit is open, the current is turned off. Here the welder strikes the electrode on the metal, like a match on a box, and slightly removes the electrode from the metal. Sparks flashed, and then a blinding arc flashed between the electrode and the metal. Guided by the hand of the worker, she slowly crawled along the junction of parts. Its flames are unbearable to human eyes. 
and this is not surprising, at the temperature of the arc reaches 3,500 degrees. This is only one and a half times less than the temperature of the hot Sunday. From such a temperature, the edges of the parts in the electrode quickly melt and the parts are welded. Here the worker took the tip of the electrode away from the metal at a distance of more than 3 to 4 millimeters. The electrical circuit opens and the arc goes out. Now you can freely admire the wonderful work of our arc. She formed a shiny scaly path at the junction of the parts, a seam. The seam firmly connected both parts into one hole. This connection method is called electric arc welding. Electric welding was used for the first time in the world by the Russian inventor N. N. Bernardos in 1882, and his method was improved somewhat later by another inventor, N. G. Slavyanov. Electric welding has great advantages over riveting and other methods of joining parts. Take, for example, the riveting of a steamship hull. It was impossible without the use of many connecting squares, but strips, steel gaskets. A lot of metal and funds were spent on the manufacture of these auxiliary parts. With electric welding, they are not all needed. And how much metal and labor was spent on riveting? For example, during the construction of an Arctic icebreaker, up to a million rivets were hammered into its hull. And for this it was necessary to drill two million holes in the body parts. With electric welding, no holes or rivets are needed. And how much time and money it took to seal rivet seams, or as it is called, chasing. The weld seam does not require this work, it is much stronger and denser than the rivet seam. The riveting was carried out by a whole team of three and even four workers. And at electric welding one worker works. Can you imagine now how much electric welding of metal, labor and money saves? Parts of the hull of the steamer are welded even faster and stronger with automatic welding machines. The most common welding machine tractor. Just do not think that this is a real tractor. You can't plow the land with such tractors, it is too low powered. He will not overcome even a big slope. And in terms of size and device, it bears little resemblance to a real tractor. But he welds steel parts remarkably. Welding machine tractor. 1. Self-propelled cart. 2. Electric motor. 3. Cable. 4. Welding head. 5. Vessel with flux. 6. Control panel. 7. Coil with electrode wire. 8 electrode wire. Here, a welder installed a small self-propelled cart along the junction of two deck sheets. Parts of the machine are mounted on the trolley. Here is a small electric motor, and a control post, and a vessel with a flux, a sandy substance, and a welding head, through the mouthpiece of which the end of the electrode wire wound on a coil is passed. The most ingenious part of the machine is the welding head. She, as they say, is a jack of all trades, as she excites an electric arc, continuously pulls the electrode wire to the place of welding, and unwinds it from the coil. And most importantly, it does not allow the arc to change its length, and this is very important for the quality of welding. Here the welder pressed the button on the control post. The cart rolled smoothly along the joint. The tip of the wire touched the joint of the parts, an electric arc was initiated. She was immediately covered with a layer of flux, which continuously pours from the vessel. The arc becomes invisible under the bubble of molten flux. It burns inside this bubble, among the vapors of molten metal and flux. Flux is a wonderful substance. It perfectly protects the welded seam from the harmful effects of nitrogen and oxygen in the air. When submerged arc welding, almost all the heat of the arc goes to fuse the edges of the parts. In manual welding, a lot of heat is dissipated in the air and metal. And what a big difference in the speed of manual and automatic welding. Talking about this difference is like comparing the speed of a pedestrian and a car. But the tractor automatic machine, weighing about 70 kilograms, is a bulky device. They cannot, as with manual welding, cook in any position and in the tightest places. He cannot weld short and curvilinear seams. And so, in 1948, scientists invented a new device, a hose semi-automatic device. He also has a cart. But only she is not self-propelled. It has a mechanism for feeding the electrode wire to the welding site. And this is a semi-automatic welding machine. 1. Welding tip with a handle and a flux funnel. 2. Flexible hose. 3. Coil with electrode wire. 4. Feeder. 5. Cable. The electrode wire is unwound from the spool and pushed by the feeder through a flexible hose to the tip, which is in the hands of the welder. Everything else is done, like with the tractor machine. 
The difference is that the welder moves the tip with the end of the wire and the flux vessel manually, while everything is mechanized with the machine. Therefore, the hose apparatus is called not an automatic machine, but a semi-automatic device. Hose semi-automatic machines can be used to weld in places that are inaccessible to the tractor machine, and faster than manual welding. But seams that go up or overhead, as they say, vertical and ceiling, cannot be welded either by a semi-automatic device or by an automatic machine. Here, even in particularly cramped places, the field of activity still remains with manual electric welding. But still, scientists believe that this is not for long. Electric welding has made a complete revolution in shipbuilding. She greatly changed and simplified the design of the ship's hull. It greatly reduced the number of operations for the manufacture of parts. Finally, electric welding helped develop new ways to build ships quickly. High-speed construction. 20 years ago, the technique of building a steamship was low. Then the body on the slipway was assembled from many thousands of individual parts and assemblies. Of the many ribs supplied in turn, they made up the skeleton of the body. Then a shell was assembled on the skeleton, again from separate sheets of outer skin and decks. All parts of the body were connected with rivets. Working conditions were difficult. The weight of the machine for drilling holes reached 30 kilograms, and the riveting pneumatic hammer, 16 kilograms. Such a tool had to be kept on the weight, often bending into three deaths in cramped compartments. The eardrums of the workers burst from the terrible ringing roar, and the lungs of a person were corroded by the smoke from the furnaces for heating the rivets. The work went like this, until the ship assemblers assemble one or another area of the hull, drillers cannot work. In the meantime, the drillers have not finished their work, there is nothing for the riveters to do here. After the riveters, chasers came to the slipway. Their job is to ensure the tightness of the rivet seams and to test the water tightness of the steamer's hull. The metal was compacted with a special tool, chasing, and tested like this, a pour water into the compartment and look from the outside, if there are any leaks in the rivet joints. If water leaked out in any place, this place was minted again. The painters were the last to arrive on the ship. They painted the tested compartments. Workers of other specialties, shipbuilders, electricians, carpenters, joiners, started work only after the steamer was launched. Empty holes descended from the slipway into the water, without mechanisms, devices and equipment. With all this, the ship was stuffed during completion afloat. Such a construction lasted for a long time, for several years. Such a pace was unacceptable. Workers and engineers, together with scientists, set about improving shipbuilding techniques. And there was a real revolution. And shipbuilders were prompted to this coup by a new way of building residential buildings. In the past, houses were built brick by brick. Then they began to assemble them from ready-made large blocks, along with window frames and other equipment. The building is now growing like a mushroom, not by the day, but by the hour. Approximately the same thing happened with the construction of the ship. Shipbuilders reasoned as follows, is it possible to liken a steamboat to a house? How to break the bottom, sides and decks of the ship into large pieces, sections? How could these sections be fabricated in advance in a workshop under convenient conditions, and then quickly assembled from them on a slipway hull of a steamer? So they did. Then the sections began to be combined into larger pieces of the steamer, blocks. A block is assembled from sections. The block is already a full-fledged piece of the hull, from side to side and from the bottom to the deck. In the assembly and welding shop of the plant, you can see the whole bow or stern end of the steamer, as well as a multi-story superstructure with decks, bulkheads, foundations for mechanisms, pipelines, various devices, and even equipped rooms. The weight of such a piece reaches 100 tons or more. There are also huge bottom and side sections 20 meters long. This means that now the body is assembled not from many thousands of individual parts and assemblies, but from several dozen sections and blocks. For a small vessel, only five to six blocks need to be made. Previously, before the launch of the steamer, it was possible to prepare in advance for the next one only parts and small components. Now, by the time of the launch of one steamer, the hull of the other is actually ready in the form of its huge pieces, sections and blocks. On the slipway, it remains only to weld them into one. A small vessel is assembled from several blocks, and the sections and blocks themselves are assembled and welded from individual parts and sheltered from the weather, spacious and insulated spans of the workshop. As a result, the working conditions of workers and the quality of work have improved.
The assembly shop occupies a large area, divided into several spans. Electric cranes move along the workshop on rails laid along the walls of the building. On the farm of each crane, a trolley with a hook that goes down and goes up with a hook moves simultaneously across the workshop. Such a crane is called a bridge. He can deliver the goods to any place in the workshop. Each aisle of the workshop has special auxiliary facilities for assembly and welding. Here is a flat, thick plate for assembling flat sections, such as bulkheads. To assemble sections with curved surfaces, special stands are installed in the form of interconnected metal trestles. They are called beds, and this name is not accidental. The section should lie snugly, as in a bed, on the upper edges of the tragus. And the shape of these edges exactly corresponds to the outer contour of the hull in the area of the section. Therefore, the section assembled on this bed will be exactly the shape that it should be. There are various tools for assembly. They serve to press the individual parts together more firmly before welding them. Each team has its own equipment. One team of workers assembles only simple sections of the sections, the other, only the deck sections, the third, the side sections, the fourth, the bottom, etc. They adjust the parts, cutting them off with gas and hemming with pneumatic hammers. Assembling a section of the vessel in the assembly and welding shop. Each part must be installed in the section so that it is not skewed. It is exactly according to the drawing and according to the layout. Such a check is often done not by shipbuilders, but by special workers, checkers. This is a very important profession in the construction of a ship. Checkers can be seen both in the workshop when assembling sections, and on the slipway when building a hull from them. But here is the section assembled and welded. Before sending this section to the slipway, it must be tested for water tightness. To verify the density of welds, they are tested with kerosene. Kerosene, more likely than other liquids, will find its way among the leaks in the seam. When testing, the seam is coated on one side with chalk paint, and on the other, thickly smeared with kerosene. If the seam is loose, then the kerosene will come out on the other side of the seam as a dark stripe on the chalk paint. Such a seam is cut down and brewed again. There may be such a case, that the seam is tight, but inside it there are cracks, voids, shells. Such a seam cannot be strong, but kerosene cannot detect internal defects. In this case, a person is helped by various devices. Previously, an x-ray machine was a good assistant in checking the quality of welds. He shone through the seam in the same way as a person is seen through in polyclinics. Now there are more advanced devices. One of these devices is called, ultrasonic floor detector. In appearance, it is quite simple, in the form of a small box with a screen on the front wall. But what a wonderful job this device does. It directs ultrasonic reconnaissance beams into the seam being checked. The beam is reflected from the inner surface of the seam and returns to the receiver of the device. If a crack, shell or other defect is encountered on the path of the reconnaissance beam, the worker controller will determine from the image on the screen what kind of defect it is and at what depth it lies. This device is also trusted only by a worker with a secondary education. Welded and tested sections and blocks on huge platforms are delivered to the slipway. When a sufficient number of them are collected there and the slipway itself is freed, they begin to assemble the ship's hull. The assembly of the hull from sections and blocks greatly accelerated both the work on the slipway and the completion of the vessel afloat. After all, sections and blocks are fed to the slipway not empty. They are still stuffed in the workshop with pipelines, auxiliary mechanisms, and various devices. And sometimes even equipment and interior decoration are produced in blocks. So not only ship assemblers and welders work in sections and blocks. Working next to them are workers of other specialties, shipbuilders, electricians, carpenters, painters. On the slipway, the scope of work is expanding even more. Here they install large equipment and perform those operations that could not be performed in the workshop. But before all this was done already afloat, after the launch of the ship on the water. And what happens? Previously, empty steel boxes were launched, but now the ship is launched almost ready remains finishing and testing. A big revolution took place in the installation work on the slipway. Take, for example, the installation of shafting. Shafting is a long line of shafts connecting a steamboat engine to a propeller. On large ships, the total length of the shafting reaches 100 meters, and individual shafts, 20 meters. Until recently, it was believed that the shafting cannot be mounted before the launch of the steamer on the water. Why? The fact is that this work requires great precision. 
After all, the axis of the shafts, including the axis of the motor shaft, must be one perfectly straight line. The axis of each shaft should not deviate from this straight line even by a tenth of a millimeter. From even the slightest misalignment, the shafts will rotate poorly in their bearings and wear out quickly. And from a large distortion, there can be an accident. The shipbuilders were afraid that they would install the shafting, and then, from the high stress and bending of the hull during the descent of the steamer, the accuracy of the assembly of the shaft line would be violated. It was this fear that forced the shafting to be mounted afloat. And only after that the main engine was installed. With this method, installation work on the ship was delayed for a long time. Now, the main engine is installed on the slipway and at the same time the shafting is being installed even before the descent. And here is another example. What is the difficulty in installing any mechanism on your foundation? There would be no difficulty in this work if it were not required for a special fit of the mechanism frame to the foundation surface. To do this, you have to perform quite painstaking work. It is necessary to level the surface of the foundation for a long time with a rotating grinding wheel, and then adjust all sorts of wedges and gaskets between the mechanism and the foundation. Now they began to do it easier and faster, and the foundation is covered with a thick layer of liquid plastic, and a mechanism is installed on it. Plastic quickly hardens and fills all the bumps and voids. Installation of ship pipelines takes a lot of effort and time from shipbuilders. We already know how many auxiliary mechanisms there are on the steamer. And from them a lot of pipes stretch through all the compartments. If you stretch these pipes into one line, you get a length of several tens of kilometers. Previously, pipes were bent by hand and with heat. Now these works are mechanized. Manual bending of pipes was replaced by cold bending on powerful machines. Shipbuilders also came up with new, high-speed methods for installing pipelines on the ship itself. How much time did it take before to fit the pipes at the place of their installation? He tries on a working pipe, it is no good, and again drags it back to the workshop to bend or cut it. How many such aimless journeys did the workers make, from the workshop to the steamer and back? Now the workshops use special layouts. This makes it possible to immediately install pipes pre-fitted according to the layout in place. Many more examples of the work of Soviet shipbuilders in a new way can be given. Now large steamships are being built two to three times faster than before the war. And what is interesting, the speed of construction is growing uncontrollably in our days. For example, the first diesel electric ship built in our country went to sea 20 months after it was laid on the slipway. And the construction of the third such electric ship took only 14 months. This is a great merit not only of the workers. After all, dozens, if not hundreds, of plants and factories are involved in the construction and equipment of a modern ship. From all parts of our country they sent steel and machinery, furniture and pipes, timber and appliances to the plant. Everything arrived right on time. Without this, high-speed construction would not be possible. Factory holiday. A ship under construction, like a house, is surrounded on all sides by scaffolding. The scaffolding is multi-tiered, and this is done in order to be able to work comfortably in each area of the building. The tiers communicate with each other by ladders. Cables are connected to each tier to provide work with electricity and pipelines, through which water, steam, compressed air and gases are supplied to the slipway for metal cutting. And on the side of the scaffolding, tall powerful cranes walk along the rails. Their job is to continuously supply finished sections, blocks and all equipment of the ship to the slipway. Assembling the hull from sections and blocks is a complex and responsible business. There is a lot of preparatory work to be done before starting this assembly. Here the main role is played by inspectors and carpenters. The inspectors begin by drawing lines on the slipway, along which the correct assembly of the hull will be checked, along the height, width and length of the ship. Carpenters install strong supports on which the bottom will rest. Such supports are primarily keel blocks. Each keel block consists of several oak beams stacked on top of each other across the hull. When building a large steamship, up to 200 keel blocks or more are installed. Some of the keel blocks are called trigger blocks. They are dismantled last, just before the steamer is launched, and are specially adapted for quick disassembly. When all the preparatory work is completed, you can start assembling the case. Here the builders have a lot of worries. The main thing is to fit the sections to each other so that smooth contours of the hull are obtained, and its dimensions correspond to those indicated on the drawing. This is where auditors are of great help. 
Every day they check the position of the hole on the slipway and the position of each new section. Another important concern is not to let the body warp from electric welding. To avoid this, the assembly and welding of the hull are carried out in strict sequence in several areas at once. At the same time, the body begins to grow and up. Bulkheads and side sections are welded to the flooring of the bottom sections, and they are covered with deck sections from above. So the gigantic core is growing every day. It grows along, in breadth and up, like a house being built floor by floor. The hull of the ship is growing every day. Finally, an important moment in the construction of the steamer comes, the loading of the main mechanisms and boilers. Mechanisms, turbines, are loaded completely ready and tested. Boilers are loaded in the same readiness, and sheathed in a light steel casing, with all valves, taps and appliances, but huge electric motors soared up and ended up on the ship. So, we have a turboelectric ship in front of us. After loading the mechanisms, the installation work is fully deployed. Start installing chimneys and pipes. By the end of construction, thousands of workers are working on the slipway in the compartments of a large steamship. The work does not stop day or night. Flashes of electric welding blind the eyes in the rooms. These are shipbuilders finishing minor work on the hull. Shipbuilders final check the installation of engines and shafting. Electricians pull electric cables along their routes, connect them to current consumers. It's not an easy job. For example, on the nuclear icebreaker under construction in our country, electricians had to install more than half a thousand electric motors and stretch about 300 kilometers of cables. The painters complete the thermal insulation of the hull and the painting of the premises. Joiners assemble furniture piece by piece and fasten it to their places, crowded and on the upper deck of the ship. Here they complete the installation of anchor, boat, cargo and other devices. And on the captain's bridge, workers of instrument making plants are busy installing and adjusting navigation and communication instruments. What only working professions cannot be found on the ship under construction? And all the workers think of only one thing, how to prepare the ship for going to sea as soon as possible and better. The descent of the ship is a great event in the life of the shipyard. On the one hand, it is a joyful holiday for workers and employees. On the other hand, this is the almost complete readiness of the ship for sailing. Preparations for the descent begin three to four weeks in advance. Carpenters are mainly involved in the preparation. First of all, they build a trigger sled from the bars. On them, the steamer will descend along the wooden parts of the slipway into the water. It will do the way a sled rolls down a snowy mountain. To do this, the surface of the tracks is thickly salted. Previously, tons of expensive lamb and beef fat were spent on stuffing. Now they manage with a cheaper mixture of paraffin and mineral oil. The carpenters still have to make special devices in order to delay the steamer put on the skid until the moment when everything is ready for launching. These are thrust arrows, hydraulic triggers and a nose delay. Persistent arrows are placed in pairs at the bow and stern of the ship from each side. The thrust boom is a short piece of wood. At one end it rests against the stock, and at the other end against the skid. Hydraulic triggers are placed in the middle part of the slide, one from each side. The trigger delays the skid until the piston of the water cylinder presses on it. Water is supplied to the cylinder. If the water stops pressing on the piston, it will not pull the trigger and it will release the skid. The nose delay is several circles of hemp rope connecting the end of each runner to a bush of logs. If it is necessary to give the detainees, they are instantly chopped with a sharp axe. Often, instead of rope delays, arrestors from steel strips are placed. Then such delayers are cut with gas cutters. Launching a steamer into the water is an operation thought out in every detail. Each participant of the descent is assigned a certain place and duties according to the schedule. This is how the rod in a turboelectric ship was launched. In the morning, a joyful revival reigned in all the shops of the plant. On this day, all worries and troubles were left behind, which shipbuilders had a lot of while the electric ship was being built on the slipway. Thousands of people hurried to the slipway, where the electric ship towered like a multi-story giant, shining in the sun with fresh paint and polished screws. It is festively decorated with garlands of flags. Festive mood and the people who filled the site at the slipway. Among them are those who designed the ship, and those who built it, and numerous guests. Everyone tries to take the most convenient place in order to properly see all the details of this interesting spectacle. The participants of the descent also took their places. 
The day before, they had what is called a dress rehearsal in the theater. Some of them boarded the electric ship. These people also have a responsible job to do. Some of them must, after the descent, inspect all the bottom compartments and make sure that there is no leak in the hull. Others, to drop anchor, release the ship from the launching sled and take it to the embankment of the plant. Every minute brings the solemn moment of descent closer. Here, the director of the plant and the commander of the descent rise to a specially equipped platform. The ladders that connected the ship with the scaffolding have already been given away. The first command rushes from the loudspeakers, a trigger kill blocks, out. Wooden bars fall to the ground, they are immediately dragged to the side. One of the builders slowly passes under the bottom of the electric ship. He must make sure that nothing prevents the descent. The results of the inspection are reported to the commander. He can now report to the director of the plant about the readiness of the ship to launch. In the ensuing silence, his words are distinctly heard, a comrade director, the ship is ready to launch. All workers are placed in their places. I ask permission to launch a new vessel. Welcome. Is heard in response. A new command is heard from the loudspeakers and nose arrows out. And after it the following, a stern arrows out. Both commands are executed accurately and quickly. The command is also executed, it give the triggers. Now only bow delays keep the ship on the slipway. Finally, the last command is given, it chop the nose delays. Now nothing holds the electric ship. For a moment, the ship seemed to be frozen in thought. An anxious thought flashed through each of the spectators, but will this colossus go down? It also happened that the ship, freed from all delaying devices, remained in place. The culprit may be a bad bait. It is also possible that sand or a piece of metal accidentally gets under the skid. This time, the fears of the audience turned out to be in vain. Joyful cries sounded over the silent slipway, a go. Let's go. Indeed, the electric ship slowly set off. A loud hooray drowned out the majestic sounds of the Soviet anthem. A rocket took off into the sky, announcing the birth of another ship of the USSR Navy. Sliding along the greasy parts, the ship picked up speed more and more. Here it crashed stern into the water, raising up a huge cascade of spray. The ship crashed stern into the water. The first voyage of the electric ship began. While very short, no more than 500 meters. With a roar, the anchors flew into the water, and the electric ship stopped, as if rooted to the spot. Two black and white-sided tugboats jumped up to him and dragged the newborn giant to the place of completion. Completion is now going on for a short time, a few months. Here they carry out such work that, for one reason or another, cannot be done on the slipway, for example, the installation of masts with arrows and equipment, rigging. During the completion of the completion, the decoration and equipment of the premises are also being completed. Tests of mechanisms, devices and the entire ship as a whole begin. And this work is very difficult and responsible. Tests show whether the ship is really built as required by the project, whether everything is in order. And only when all the tests are completed, all the defects found by the selection committee are eliminated, the flag of the Soviet Union is raised on the electric ship. This means that the ship has entered service. The electric ship goes under its own power to the port berth to take cargo and passengers on its first voyage. Let's go to the port and visit the built ship. Walk on the electric ship Motherland. A snow-white, light-filled mass rises near the pier. Everywhere is the hustle and bustle that is usual when a ship goes on a voyage. Cranes work, laying stocks and cargoes in the holds. Passengers are climbing up the ladder. Some of them get on the ship in an unusual way, but they drive in their own cars through a large hole in the side, right into the ship's garage. Below, on the pier, and above, on the decks of the electric ship, there is animation everywhere, ringing laughter, cheerful bustle. Having boarded the electric ship, the passenger is at first lost, but where can he find his temporary accommodation among the many similar premises of the seven-story floating hotel? What deck is his cabin on? But the confusion of the passenger does not last long. Arrows and inscriptions show him the way. The elevator operator hospitably opens the elevator doors for him. And the passenger does not have time to come to his senses, as he is already standing in front of the door of his cabin. The cabin has all the amenities that turn the journey of a Soviet person into a pleasant vacation. The cabin has all the amenities that make the trip a pleasant stay. There is soft comfortable furniture, 
plenty of light, a radio, a table fan, a wash basin with cold and hot water, even a ship's automatic telephone station. Of course, these conveniences are very different from the unnecessary luxury that the shipping companies of the capitalist countries try to show off for the sake of advertising. There, all the amenities are designed for the capitalist languishing from idleness and boredom. At the service of millionaires are seven-room cabins with a whole staff of servants, palm gardens and overly richly furnished salons four stories high. On such ships there is even a dog hotel with a bathroom and a special kitchen. And there was somehow even such a case when, in order to place a noble horse, on one ship, four cabins of the first class were adapted by breaking out bulkheads. For transporting his pet across the ocean to the races, the owner paid £5,000. There are no such conveniences on our ships. But everything that is available here is available to every Soviet person. But now the final preparations are being completed before the departure of the ship. The powerful bass of Rodina's whistle drowns out all the noise on the pier for a minute, with the rumble of cranes, the sharp whistles of steam locomotives, and the many-voiced hubbub of people. Passengers are waving their handkerchiefs, laughing, crying. They are trying to shout something to their relatives and friends who remain below. But the efforts are in vain. From the high side it is difficult even to distinguish the faces of the mourners. Everything merges into one solid mass. The train departs slowly. Soon the marina and the whole port are out of sight. The weather is excellent. Swimming should be fun. But I want to make it useful too, at least get to know the ship briefly. Let's fulfill this desire and go through the most interesting places of the electric ship. Its length is 180 meters. To get around all the decks and rooms without exception, we probably just don't have enough time. Expand the drawing attached at the end of the book and follow closely. Here we go through the passenger areas. Bright light illuminates the corridors, platforms and ladders, sparkling clean, lined with fluffy carpets. A lot of light indicators, inscriptions and announcements do not allow passengers to get lost. Passing through the corridors, we see not only the cabins. There are cozy salons and lounges, a library reading room, a children's room, a concert hall, large restaurants. Beautiful decoration of walls and ceilings, excellent paintings, wonderful comfortable furniture adorn all these rooms. Here is the entrance to the cinema hall, which can accommodate 300 people. There is an announcement in the window that the color feature film Don Quixote is being shown tonight. Some of my companions wanted to get into the open air. The elevator immediately granted this wish. We are already on the top, sunny, deck. On the sun deck there is a swimming pool and solarium. There really is nowhere to hide from the sun. On one side of the sunny deck is a sports field, fenced with a high net. Passengers play tennis and volleyball on it. On the other side is a large swimming pool and solarium. You can swim in the pool, even play water polo. Next to the pool there is a dressing room, cold and hot showers. On the sunny deck, closer to the bow of the electric ship, there is the most interesting room. This is the command cabin, the ship's control center. There are so many devices here that you won't get acquainted with them in a day. It was decided that a separate excursion would be organized to the command cabin. In the meantime, we go down to the next, the boat deck. It is so called because it has lifeboats. Lifeboats are installed on the boat deck. Empty zinc boxes are fixed inside the boats. Such boxes for the boat are like floats. It will flood it all with water, but it still will not sink. Each boat is equipped with a searchlight and a compass, a supply of crackers and canned food, a barrel of fresh water, and life buoys. All this is prepared in case an accident at sea forces people to leave the ship. But how to launch a boat from a high deck into the water? After all, this deck is about 15 meters raised above the surface of the sea. To do this, at the ends of each boat are two curved steel beams. These are davits. From the top, cables with blocks at both ends descend to the boat. They are called boat hoists. With such hoists you can lift the boat from its place, and it will hang in the air. Then the davits lean overboard and the boat is above the water. This is called dumping the boat overboard. Then the matter seems to be simple, to lower the boat into the water. If the boat is small, it is lowered manually. And for the descent of large boats use electric winches. But launching a boat in a storm is not so easy. Toge and wait that, until it reaches the water, it will be smashed to smithereens on the steel side of the ship. You need to have a lot of experience and skill in order to safely lower the boat in a fever and confusion, and even when the ship is healing in big waves. 
but so far, there is no danger to the electric ship. The boats are firmly attached to their bed with cables, or, as sailors say, they are lashed in a marching manner, and canvas covers are stretched over them. From the boathouse we descend to the promenade deck. Its purpose is clear from the name itself. Passengers walk along it. And if they get tired, they have comfortable chairs at their service, placed right there on the sides. It is nice to relax in such an armchair, breathe in the life-giving sea air, read an interesting book or admire the seagulls, oncoming ships and the picturesque coast when it is visible. Below the promenade is another superstructure deck, and then the upper deck. On the open part of the upper deck, we saw a hairdresser's, a clothing and shoe repair shop, kiosks selling books and soft drinks, flowers and fruits. In the middle part of the upper deck is the factory kitchen of the electric ship, its galley. Here you can see huge electric stoves, meat grinders, dough mixers and bread slices. And next to the galley is a real bakery. Electric ovens bake about a thousand kilograms of bread, pies, buns, and cakes every day. Two dozen cooks and bakers work at stoves, boilers and ovens. Food from the galley is delivered to the restaurant by special elevators. Everything on the electric ship is electrified, elevators, cranes, winches and numerous auxiliary mechanisms for turning the rudder, lowering and raising anchors, boats and ladders. There are many different pumps, compressors, fans, motors on the ship, and they are all electric. Electricity cools pantries for perishable food. Fresh air is supplied to residential and service premises through ventilation ducts, cooled in the heat, and in cold weather, on the contrary, heated. Electric current warms a number of rooms with the help of heaters installed in them. Electric current sets in motion all the instruments and apparatus necessary to control the ship. Finally, a lot of electrical energy goes into lighting. There are more than 10,000 light bulbs in the interior of the ship alone. As you can see, the consumption of electrical energy is huge. But it is produced in sufficient quantities on the ship itself. For this there is a special power plant. The current from the station runs through the wires to all the premises of the ship. If you stretch these wires into a line, you get a length of several hundred kilometers. But this is an auxiliary station. The main station of the electric ship provides current for the movement of the ship. It is located in the engine room, you already know about it. The train is on course. Here we are in the command room. In its front part there is a covered room, similar to the veranda of a house, but of a larger size. It is the same as the veranda, glazed. From here, as in the palm of your hand, you can see the entire space surrounding the ship. This is the wheelhouse. All electrical control devices are concentrated here. Let's get acquainted with the main ones. In the wheelhouse of an electric ship, here at the front glazed wall are two cabinets. These are devices for controlling the movement of the vessel. What is in these cabinets? One of them contains the already familiar machine telegraph, but with two handles and two dials, for the right and left electric motors separately. On the dials, the inscriptions gleam, a stop, small forward, full forward, and others. The second pedestal has two controllers, the same as we always see on the front platform of the tram car. Have you observed how a tram leader works? So he turned the controller knob to the right from the middle position, and the car moves forward. The handle will return back to the middle, the car will stop. If you turn the handle to the left, it will go back. But the tram does not need complex maneuvers, it moves only along the rails. Another thing is electric. Many maneuvers must be done to him in a cramped port before he approaches the pier. There is no time to transmit orders to the electrician using the machine telegraph, as usual. It is much easier to control the operation of the electric motors yourself, right from here, from the wheelhouse. That's what controllers are for. The huge ship changes its course, obeying a slight turn of the handle. The controller helps the captain and his assistants to carry out any, the most cunning maneuvers of the electric ship. And on the high seas, they manage with one machine telegraph. Closer to the back wall, behind which the navigation cabin is located, there is another pedestal, to which the steering wheel is attached. This is a steering wheel. And in front of him is another pedestal, a binnacle, in which there is a magnetic compass. This is an ancient device. Once upon a time, the device of a compass was simple, a piece of cork with a magnetic needle attached to it floated in a small vessel with water. But in the 14th century, the Italian joyer improved it. He planted a magnetic needle on a vertical axis, a hairpin, and attached it to a black paper circle called a card. Cartouche.
was divided around the circumference into 16 equal divisions, rums, magnetic compass card. Julia placed all this device in a dry round box, a pot. Since then, the magnetic compass has undergone many improvements. But even now it still looks like Julia's compass. The pot is no longer dry, but filled with a mixture of alcohol and water. It is freely suspended in the binnacle on two articulated axles. The axles are made so ingeniously that, no matter how the ship rocks at sea, the bola will always be in a horizontal position, but it cannot turn around. On the inside, a heading line is applied, which is exactly aligned with the direction of the bow of the vessel. The cauldron is covered with glass on top, and at the bottom there is a vertical pin, on which a potato with a spherical float in the middle is planted. Magnetic arrows are attached to the bottom of the card. So they unfold the floating card so that it always looks north with its zero division, indicated by the letter N. Equal divisions, 360 degrees, are applied around the circumference of the card. And the main points are indicated by the letters of the countries of the world. Magnetic compass device. 1. Binnacle. 2. Bola hat. 3. Axes of articulated. Gimbal. Suspension. 4. Lighting device. 5. Magnetic arrows. 6. Card. 7. Float. 8. Hairpin. 9. Liquid. 10. Protective glass. 11. Course line. Heading. 45 degrees. N.O. The value of the angle between the fixed course line and the division of the card shows us the course of the electric ship. It is enough just to see what division of the card is against the line. Here is the officer on duty commanding the helmsman, a heading 45 degrees. Yes, course 45. Follows the answer. And after a while the helmsman reports, on the rumba, 45. This means that the compass heading line has been set against division 45 and the ship is heading exactly to the northeast. Now just try to keep the line against this place on the card. And this is not an easy task. The ship sometimes prowls. But it happened even worse, and the ship completely lost its course. Here, the waves, wind and currents had nothing to do with it, but the compass itself deceived people. This happened in those cases when there were steel parts of the case next to it or an electric current passed. The correct readings of the compass are also violated by the so-called magnetic storms. From the inaccuracy of the compass, one must expect any trouble, or one can run aground and run into coastal rocks. In 1862, off the coast of Ireland, only because of the incorrectness of the readings of the magnetic compass, one after the other, two large ocean steamers were lost. Several hundred people, cargo and ships were destroyed by the deviation of the arrows of a small instrument. This deviation of the compass needles from the direction of the magnetic meridian is called deviation. The fight against deviation is a very important matter in navigation. But the sailors are not able to completely destroy the deviation. And so they came up with a compass that is not afraid of the neighborhood of steel and electric current. This is an electromechanical compass, or, as it is called, a gyrocompass. In terms of design, it is very similar to the gyroscopic stabilizer you already know. The main part of the gyrocompass is also a massive disc, but, of course, much smaller. In the same way, the axis of a rotating top disc, with any deviation, always, like the roly poly roly poly, tends to the same position, in the plane of the geographic meridian. The gyro compass gives the ship the true heading. It does not need the corrections that have to be introduced into the readings of a magnetic compass for deviation and for the difference in the directions of the magnetic and geographic meridians. And this difference is big. Imagine that a person is constantly heading straight in the direction where the dark end of the needle of a simple magnetic compass points. He goes north, but never gets to the North Pole. It turns out that the compass will lead him to the northern tip of Canada, to the island of Prince of Wales. This is where the magnetic pole is located. And, as you can see, it is far from here to the geographic North Pole. The gyro compass itself is installed in the interior of the ship and its readings are automatically transmitted by wire to repeater compasses. Such compasses are installed in the wheelhouse and chart house and other places. The repeaters exactly repeat the readings of the gyro compass and no longer let the sailors down. The gyro compass transmits the reading of the ship's heading to other devices, the gyroscope steering, heading recorder and auto plotter. What are these devices? The gyroscope steering is located right there, next to the steering column. It saves the helmsman from troublesome and stressful work at the helm. Without any human help, he keeps the ship on a given course, does not allow him to scour. 
It is worth the ship for any reason to stray from its course, as a gyroscope ruler, receiving the exact direction of movement from the gyro compass, will immediately correct the situation. With the help of a special device connected to the rudder, the gyroscope rudder returns the vessel to the previous set course. Automatic steering, gyroscope rudder. A gyro compass repeater is installed on the top of the device. Well, what if you need to change the course of the ship at all? Then turn on this device and the helmsman rotates the steering wheel until the compass line is set on the new course. After that, the control of the vessel is again entrusted to the gyrola. On long straight sections of the vessel's route, the helmsman on watch only controls the course. The gyroscope ruler honestly works for him. The heading chart is installed in the navigational cabin. This device automatically records all changes in the ship's heading. Inside the course graph, a special mechanism pulls a paper tape. While the ship is on its course, the stylus pen draws a straight line on the tape. But as soon as the ship goes off course, zigzags appear on the tape. Zigzags appear on the course graph tape. From these zigzag records, it is easy to determine both the moment the ship turned to a new course and the duration of following one course or another. Sailors call the course graph sneak. This device can tell the navigator whether the helmsman was faithfully keeping watch, whether he kept the ship on a given course. An autoplotter is an automatic device for recording a ship's path on a chart. Previously, this painstaking work, with the help of a compass, protractor and rulers, was performed by the navigator. Now he is relieved of such work. The card is spread on a special steel board, along which a carriage with a pencil automatically moves. The autoplotter's pencil draws the line of the ship's path on the map under the simultaneous action of two instruments on it, a gyro compass and a log. The gyro compass gives the direction of the line, and the log moves the pencil forward with light pushes. The autoplotter automatically records the ship's path. What is a lag? This is a device for determining the speed and distance traveled by the ship. In the old days, a manual log was used. Its device is simple, but to a wooden float, in the form of a sector, a thin rope was attached, a lag line, divided by marks, knots, into equal parts, each 120th of a mile long. A heavy lead rim was attached along the arc of the sector. With such a rim, the sector stood vertically in the water. The resistance of the water did not allow him to move easily with the ship, and he actually remained in place. The ship was moving away from the sector, and the laglin was pitted astern. Letting it out of his hands, the sailor counted how many knots were thrown into the water in 120th of an hour, that is, in half a minute. This number of knots in half a minute corresponded to the number of nautical miles traveled by the ship in an hour. Now it is clear why the ship's speed is still determined in knots. The manual log had many disadvantages. It could not show the ship's speed continuously. From time to time it had to be thrown out and selected. And most importantly, the manual log did not give evidence of the path traveled by the vessel. The sailors were unhappy with this log, but for a long time it remained the only means of determining the speed of the ship. Only at the end of the 19th century, using the idea of Lomonosov, they began to use a turntable instead of a sector. First, she was towed astern, and then they began to push through a hole in the bottom of the vessel. The new logs were called turntables. The main part of such a lag is a transmitter with a four-blade turntable embedded in the bottom of the vessel. On the move of the vessel, the flow of water rotates the extended turntable. The greater the speed, the stronger the oncoming flow and the faster the spinner rotates. Its rotation with the help of a special electromechanical device is transmitted by wire to the arrows of the speed indicator and the counter of the distance traveled, as well as to the autoplotter. When there is no need for the work of the lag, it is removed inside the vessel, and the hole in the bottom is closed with a special valve, a clinket. However, the turntable lag also has major drawbacks. For example, foreign objects, especially algae, often get into the spinner. The lag often fails. That is why 20 years ago they began to widely use new ones, hydraulic logs. The hydraulic log also determines the speed, and hence the distance traveled, by the pressure force of the oncoming flow of water that occurs when the vessel moves. Its operation is based on the difference between the water pressure in two extended tubes. In one tube, turned towards the flow, towards the bow, a total pressure is created, which depends both on the speed of the vessel and on the depth of its immersion in water. In the other, deployed to the stern, there is pressure only from the depth of immersion of this tube, that is, static pressure. The lagger transmission mechanism with tubes is installed on the vessel below the load waterline. 
Inside the transmission mechanism there is a vessel divided by a movable horizontal partition into two parts. The upper part of the vessel is connected to the seawater by a static tube, and the lower part is connected to a full pressure tube. When the vessel is stationary, the water pressure in both parts of the vessel is the same and the partition is in place. But then the ship begins to move, and the pressure balance is disturbed. The pressure in the lower part becomes greater, causing the septum to rise upward. This movement of the partition with the help of an electromechanical device is transmitted to the arrows of the instruments. The hydraulic lag has one serious drawback, at the complexity of its design. And imagine that the lag has deteriorated, has ceased to give indications of speed and distance traveled. How to be here? Is the navigator really deprived of the opportunity to lay the path of the vessel? No, a special device hanging in the command cabin comes to his rescue. This is a boat engine RPM counter. Scheme of the hydraulic lag. 1. Movable partition, E2. Static pressure tube, E3. Full pressure tube, E4. Pusher rod, 5. System of levers, E6. Pointer arrow, E7. Pointer scale, 8. Spring. Knowing the number of revolutions of the shaft, and hence the propeller, it is possible to determine the speed of the vessel from a special table. This speed is not entirely accurate, but the navigator can continue his work. There are many different communication devices in the wheelhouse of the electric ship. These are telephones and all kinds of sound and light electrical signal devices. They connect the command cabin of the electric ship with many rooms of the vessel. Here, for example, is a fire alarm station. Wires run to it from everywhere. If a fire breaks out in any room, the air from heating begins to expand and put pressure on the elastic plate of the detector installed there. The plate closes the current in the device, and a red light immediately flashes on the signal station. That way they know where the fire started. All the instruments in the command cabin greatly facilitate the work of the captain and his assistants. They allow a ship to make long-distance ocean voyages with the same confidence as if it was sailing along the coast in a well-studded area. But this is not enough, the electric ship needs to keep in touch with other ships and with ports. This means that he needs to somehow transmit and receive signals, to speak and listen. Previously, the language of the ship was signal flags, during the day, and a flashing light bulb transmitting signals in Morse code, at night, and even a whistle, a bell and a siren. And ears, the eyes and hearing of the watchman. Of course, you can use such means only at close range. Now the tongue and ears of steamships and motor ships operate both at close and at a distance. Radio is used for long distance communication. In the radio room, on the solar deck, there are powerful receivers and transmitters. There are powerful receivers and transmitters in the radio room. With their help, you can talk from an electric ship at a distance of many thousands of miles. Thanks to the radio, Soviet sailors do not feel cut off from their homeland, no matter where they are. Every event in the life of our country finds the liveliest response among the sailors who are at sea. Let us take, for example, such a joyful event as the elections to local Soviets of working people's deputies. On this day, the radio widely pushes the boundaries of the electoral districts of the Kirovsky district of Leningrad, to which the crews of all ships of the Baltic Shipping Company are assigned. These borders become unbounded. Baltic sailors vote under all latitudes in different seas and oceans, from the coast of Antarctica to the English Channel, from the Pacific Ocean to the sultry Mediterranean Sea. This is how the recent elections to the Council of Leningrad took place on the ship Jean Jaws. At night, on the eve of a significant day, the steamer sailed along the coast of France. There was still a lot of time before the voting began, and a queue had already accumulated at the entrance to the wardroom. Finally, the sailor on duty rang the bell, a bell, the long-awaited time, six o'clock. And the doors opened wide in front of smartly dressed sailors. The words of the chairman of the election commission, Bosun Petikov, sound solemnly, I congratulate you, comrades, on a great holiday, on election day. Please start voting. After 20 minutes, the ship's radio operator was already reporting the election results to Leningrad, all the sailors of the ship, as one person, voted for the people's candidates. The radio is also a wonderful assistant to the navigator in his work on driving the ship. From time immemorial, navigators determine their position in the sea by eye, by the sun or stars. Then, in addition to the compass, a sextant appeared. This is a device that allows you to determine the height of the sun or any star above the horizon. A sextant measures the height of the sun above the horizon. Knowing this height and, using the chronometer, the exact time of observation, it is not difficult to find the position of the ship in the sea using special tables. 
but to work with a sextant, you need a clear sky. And how can you determine the location of the vessel if there is fog or clouds? Under such conditions of navigation, the radio comes to the aid of the navigator. Electromagnetic waves emitted by coastal radio stations and captured by a ship station can successfully replace the light of a coastal beacon in any bad weather and at a great distance. To do this, the ship has a special device, a radio direction finder. According to the signals of two coastal radio stations, the location of which is known on the map, the direction finder easily determines the location of the ship. Here, the radio direction finder antenna plays an important role, receiving radio waves in a strictly defined direction. The radio direction finder antenna has the shape of a round frame rotating around a vertical axis. The radio direction finder antenna has the shape of a round frame. When the navigator tunes the receiver to the station he has chosen, he turns the frame until the audibility of the station becomes very poor. This means that the frame plane is perpendicular to the direction of the radio waves coming from the coast station. Then, on a special scale, determine the direction to the station or, as they say, count the bearing. In the same way, the bearing is counted to another coast radio station. Having drawn these bearings on the sea chart, the navigator at the point of their intersection will find the location of the vessel. And there are also such radio devices that work by themselves. They don't need a radio operator or a navigator. Here the ship is in trouble. It is necessary to immediately broadcast a distress signal, but the radio operator was not in place. But there are always people on the bridge. One of them rushes to a small board with a glowing inscription SOS and breaks the glass. In the radio room, the automatic radio operator immediately starts working. Without any human intervention, he not only sends a distress signal on the air, but also gives the coordinates of the ship that has crashed. You have heard about the diesel electric ship Bob, which delivered the Soviet expedition to the icy expanses of Antarctica. The first such automatic radio operator was installed on this ship. There are two more devices in the command cabin of the electric ship. And each of them is a real miracle of technology. Echo I and Radio I. The man fell into the gorge and clapped his hands. In less than a few seconds, he will hear a faint sound in response. This means that the sound was reflected from the rock and returned to the person in the form of an echo. A long time ago people knew about the existence of an echo. But for a long time they could not derive any practical benefit from it. For the first time, the Russian academician Yakov Dmitrievich Sakharov succeeded in doing this. In 1804, having risen in a balloon high above St. Petersburg, he shouted into a bullhorn directed to the ground. When Zakharov caught the echo of his voice, he noted the time it took the sound to travel to the ground and back. And then it was no longer difficult for him, knowing the speed of sound propagation in the air, to calculate at what height the balloon was located. In our time, people thought of using echo to measure the depths of the seas and oceans. So there was a wonderful device, an echo sounder. During the operation of the echo sounder, not ordinary sounds audible to the human ear are used, but super sounds, or ultrasounds. Who creates these sounds? It turns out that a thin plate of quartz. If an alternating electric current is passed through such a plate, then it begins to breathe, that is, it alternately contracts and stretches. In one second, the plate breathes up to 700,000 times. And no matter how light her breathing is, it carries along the particles of the environment, giving rise to a supersonic wave. We do not hear these waves, but their action can be clearly seen. If an oscillating plate of quartz is placed in a vessel with a liquid, then we will see something extraordinary. Here, the particles of the excited liquid begin to fly like a whirlwind. The ultrasonic hurricane rolls its waves more and more violently. A hill up to 100 millimeters high is formed above the surface of the liquid, and drops of this liquid fly up half a meter and higher. Well, what if not one, but ten or more records breathe like this? Can you imagine what sounds an echo sounder will send to the bottom of the sea or ocean if you equip it with many quartz plates? How does an echo sounder work? A steel box is welded to the bottom of the vessel, a pack of quartz plates is mounted in it. When a current is passed through these plates, they begin to breathe. The breathing of the plates is transmitted by a directed beam into the water and causes its powerful oscillatory movements, ultrasonic waves. These waves rush down through the water column, reach the bottom, are reflected from it and run back in the form of an echo. Ultrasonic waves reach the bottom of the sea, are reflected from it and run back. 1. Emitter and receiver of the echo sounder. 2. Device, echo sounder pointer. 
The echo is picked up by a second pack of records mounted in the same box, and is immediately converted into electrical vibrations. These electrical signals are fed to the scale of a special device, on which the arrow will show in meters the depth of the sea or the distance to any underwater object that reflects the sound. And for some echo sounders, the depth of the sea is shown in the form of strokes applied to a paper tape by a self-recording device. Once upon a time, the depth of the seas was measured with a hand lot, that is, with a rope with a load at the end. It was a long and imprecise job. And they did not even dream of measuring the depth of the oceans. The echo sounder is amazingly accurate and quickly measures any depth. To measure a depth of 3 kilometers with a simple lot, more than an hour is spent. The echo sounder needs seconds to do this. With the help of an echo sounder, it was possible to accurately measure the greatest depth of the ocean, 10,863 meters. Such a depth was near the Mariana Islands in the Pacific Ocean. And what is important, measuring the depth with a simple lot is possible only from a stationary vessel, and with an echo sounder, even at full speed. An echo sounder does more than just measure depth. When the ship sails over underwater heights and valleys, the sonar recorder draws on paper the exact profile of this bottom. When crossing the sea, you can bring with you an image of the topography of its bottom along the line of the ship's path. And since many ships ply the sea in all directions, it is easy to draw up an accurate map of the entire seabed from the records of their echo sounders. So the echo sounder turns into an echo eye. By recording on a paper tape, you can find out, for example, whether there are sand drifts at the bottom. Echo Eye helps you quickly find the places of sunken ships in order to raise them from the bottom of the sea. It even shows in what position these ships lie underground. The Echo Eye brings great benefits to Soviet fishermen. Using the Echo Eye, they detect fish accumulations in the depths of the sea, the density and size of the school. Some similarity with the Echo Sounder has another, amazing device installed in a special room in the command cabin. It is called a radar. There are many remarkable things about this device. The main thing in his work, as in the echo sounder, is the reflection from oncoming objects. But here, not sound, but radio waves are already reflected. This is where the similarity in the operation of both devices ends. And above all because the speed of radio waves is about 300,000 km per second. It is almost a million times greater than the speed of sound in air. This means that a radio wave can fly around all the borders of the Soviet Union five times in one second. From a rock seven kilometers away from us, the sound echo will arrive in 20 seconds, and the radio echo in 200 thousandths of a second. And with a shorter distance, there will be not even hundred thousandths, but millionths of a second. It is clear that no chronometer can detect such a time. But the radar detects and even records. Moreover, he calculates for a person how far a radio wave will travel during this time. The ability of radio waves to reflect from oncoming objects and return back in the form of a radio echo was first discovered in our country. This discovery was made by the great inventor of radio, Alexander Stepanovich Popov. It was like this, in 1897, A.S. Popov, together with his assistant Ribkin, tested the world's first radio device on the Kronstadt Roadstead. He wanted to increase the range of the apparatus as much as possible. To change the distance between the transmitter and receiver of the device, Popov installed them on different ships. The transmitter was on the training ship Europa, and the receiver was on the cruiser Africa. The test went well. Ribkin sat at the receiver and with intense attention peered at the dots and dashes of the Morse code that appeared on the telegraph tape. Suddenly, the characters became less and less frequent, and then completely disappeared. What kind of occasion is this? Ribkin was surprised and looked out the window. He saw how the mine cruiser Lieutenant Ilian was passing between Europe and Africa. The mine cruiser blocked the space between the two ships. The radio waves sent from Europe met an unexpected obstacle, the hull of a passing ship. That is why the radio waves did not reach the receiver on Africa, and the Morse signs on the tape disappeared. There was only one thing left for the radio waves, it to be reflected from the board of Lieutenant Ilian and returned to Europe. But then the mine cruiser passed, and the receiver started working again. Popov immediately found the reason for such an amazing phenomenon. He already then predicted that the reflection of radio waves will be used with great benefit to mankind. Popov's prediction came true only after 40 years, the first radar appeared in 1938. How does a radar work? It turns out that it does not send radio waves continuously. The transmitter will send some portion of the waves, and then automatically turn off. 
The radio waves will be reflected from the oncoming object, and the receiver will already meet them. Then the transmitter will start up a new portion of waves and again rest. This is how they work alternately, either the transmitter or the receiver. Such work is needed so that the transmitted waves do not mix with the radio echo, and also to accurately detect the moment of departure of the radio waves and the return of the echo. The radio echo, returning back, reports only about the meeting with some object. In what direction did the meeting take place? The receiver does not talk about this. This is where a radar antenna comes in handy. It doesn't look like a radio station antenna at all. A radio station's antenna sends out radio waves in all directions. A radar antenna doesn't do that. You have, of course, seen how a magnifying glass works. It collects the sun's rays into one point. Similarly, a radar antenna gathers radio waves into a beam and sends it in a narrow beam in one direction. The radar antenna is fixed to the vessel's mast or bridge and rotates at all times. Therefore, when releasing radio waves, it seems to probe the surrounding space, just like a searchlight beam darts everywhere and each time a special device shows the direction in which this or that beam of waves is released. If the beam does not meet any obstacle, then do not wait for it back. It will no longer return to the radar receiver. As soon as the beam meets an object and is reflected from it by a radio echo, they immediately know the direction to this object. Moreover, a special radar device measures and records those millionths of a second in which a beam of radio waves reaches an object and returns back and a special scale makes it possible to instantly determine how far an object is. Finally, the image of the object appears on the screen of this device. What is this wonderful device? This is a cathode ray tube. Describing it in detail is a rather difficult task. Better to see with your own eyes. And you can see a cathode ray tube not only in the radar. The screen of an ordinary TV is the bottom of such a tube. We will try to describe this tube at least in general terms. A cathode ray tube looks like a glass bottle with a long neck and a wide convex bottom, a screen coated with a special luminous substance. At the end of the neck is an electronic projector, or, as it is called, an electron gun. She shoots at the screen not with projectiles, but with the smallest particles of negative electricity, electrons. After leaving the gun, the electron flow encounters a cap with a hole on its way. From it, electrons rush to the screen no longer randomly, but in a narrow beam. Further on the way of electrons there is a tube electrode. It is charged with positive electricity and therefore strongly attracts electrons to itself, speeding up their flight. A furious bombardment of the screen with electrons begins. But the electron beam, although narrow, can give a blurry spot on the screen. And you need a bright point. How to be here? Then they came up with the idea of putting another electrode in the form of a ring between the electron gun and the screen. This electrode is designed in such a way that it compresses the electron beam to the thinnest beam. Therefore, the electron gun shoots exceptionally accurately, hitting a whole beam of electrons at one point. It is from these points that the image on the screen is obtained. How is it done? It turns out that the electron beam turns into a pencil that draws and the plates of horizontal and vertical deflection of the cathode ray tube help him. Only after passing through two pairs of such plates, the electron beam is able to draw up to 20,000 different lines per second on the screen. Line by line, an electronic pencil walks across the surface of the screen. This is how an image of an object caught by the radar is created on the screen of the cathode ray tube. Panorama of the area, left, and its image on the all-round view screen, right. Here the radar sends a radio signal into space. A large spike instantly appears on the screen. It shows zero range to the target. Until the radio echo returns, the electron beam continues to draw a horizontal line. The return of the radio echo is marked on the screen by the appearance of another tooth, a smaller one. The gap between the teeth is the distance to the caught target. On the screen there is a scale bar with which you can immediately determine how far the target is. As we already know, Radar gives hundreds of signals per second, the same number of times the teeth appear on the screen. But to the human eye, they appear to be continuously luminous. And then there are all-round screens. Here the electron beam draws thousands of lines running away from the center. A lot of bright bunnies flash on the screen in the directions in which the echo reflected by the target returned. Together, these bunnies give a characteristic, understandable only to a radar specialist, a radiometrist, a picture of the space surrounding the ship. 
according to the distances from the center, according to the size, shape and nature of the movement of the bunnies, the radiometrist determines what and where flickers in front of him, whether a huge rock rises, whether a ship is moving, or a dolphin frolicking in the sea. That's how a cathode ray tube makes radar a ship's shrewd eye. Radar is an indispensable tool for the safe navigation of ships. A ship equipped with a radar detects rocks, reefs and icy mountains in time, invisible in the dark or in fog. In any weather, a ship can pass through a narrow strait and enter without any incident into a harbor filled with ships, without resorting to the help of a pilot. On the radar screen, you can detect oncoming ships hundreds of kilometers away, as well as aircraft in the air. You can watch their movement all the time and determine their course, speed and changing distance to them. Radar is becoming an excellent means of monitoring the movement of ships in large seaports. There, the dispatcher regulates traffic, helps ships avoid collisions and accidents in crowded conditions. Radar is also widely used in navigation. To determine the position of a vessel at sea, it is necessary to contact one of the radar beacons installed in advanced known places on the coast using a radar. The radar beacon receiver will receive a signal, a request from the ship's radar and with its help automatically set in motion a special transmitter that will emit a response signal. Having received such a signal, the radiometrist will determine the direction and distance to the beacon. Thus, he will immediately find the position of the vessel at sea. It is not yet known what else the radar will surprise us with as it improves. Who has not read the wonderful fairy tale about the magic mirror? You could see whatever you want in it. The action of such a mirror was not limited by any distances. Maybe the time will come when the fairy tale about the magic mirror will become a reality. People thousands of kilometers away will not only talk to their relatives, but also see them in their familiar home environment. It may even be sooner than we expect. Part 4. What are steamboats? Sea workers. There are many different specialties for sea steamers. There are both passenger and cargo ships among them. Yes, and cargo ships are of different types, a coal carriers, ore carriers, grain carriers. Some carry only packaged goods, while others carry cargo directly into the hold. Boards and logs are stacked on timber trucks, and perishable goods are transported in refrigerated ships, sea tugs pull barges behind them and take large steamships out of ports. There are fishing, crab and whaling vessels. Rescue boats rescue the injured. Icebreakers are adapted to work in ice, and sailors are trained on training ships. All these vessels bear little resemblance to each other. And each of them has its own device, special, in accordance with what it is intended for. There are also ships that transport entire trains at once through wide straits. We will tell you in more detail about the ferry vessel connecting the railways of the Crimea and the Caucasus through the Ketch Strait. Two locomotives, puffing heavily, push a long line of freight cars under the very arches of the pier, to which a strange-looking ship moored, its bow and stern are exactly the same shape. Its entire upper deck is occupied by several rows of rails. Railway workers fasten the rails of the shore with the rails of the ship with locks. The cars are slowly rolled onto the deck and are located along the sides. The whole loading takes several minutes, although the ferry takes 32 wagons. The ship slowly moves away from the pier. The train sets sail. And it lasts about an hour. Here is the coast. There is no need for the ferry to turn around, so there is no need to waste time here either. They are already waiting for him at the Kafka station. As soon as the ferry hits the shore, the locomotives bring the trains to the pier and drag them to the station. And a passenger train, just arrived from Krasnodar, is moving towards the ferry ship. This is how the ship makes its voyages on a fine sunny day. Well, what if a winter storm breaks out over the strait and the ice fields rush uncontrollably from the sea of backslash U-200B backslash U-200B Azov to the Black Sea? It turns out that the ship ferry is adapted to such sailing conditions. In terms of strength, its hull is in no way inferior to icebreakers. It has two powerful diesel electric units. Vessel control is automatic. To perform any maneuver, just press the button on the captain's bridge. And if an impenetrable fog hangs over the strait? And it's not a problem. Now the radar is on. On its screen, the watch navigator will see the outlines of the coast and sailing ships. Such ferries reduce the transportation of goods and passengers for many hundreds of kilometers. The ferry boat approaches the shore. But there are few ferry ships, because they are not needed everywhere. But there are more than 30,000 ordinary transport ships all over the world. And they are arranged differently. Take, for example, passenger and cargo ships. 
A large passenger steamer, as you already know, has many comfortable cabins and other accommodations that turn a trip into a pleasant vacation for hundreds, and sometimes thousands of people. To create comfort for 40-50 people on the crew of a cargo ship, not so much space is needed. But almost the entire volume of such a vessel, except for the engine room, is occupied by cargo holds. After all, somewhere it is necessary to accommodate many thousands of tons of cargo? A high-speed passenger steamer is a dandy with beautiful hull contours, with a long multi-story superstructure of a streamlined shape, with a funnel proudly thrown back. It sparkles with a pure white color. It is difficult to resist the delight, watching how such a handsome man is approaching the pier. A cargo ship looks different. Its appearance is very modest, but the color of the side is dark, there is no particular grace in the body. On the upper deck there is a short, two-tire, middle superstructure, above it is a navigation bridge. There is a small cabin in the stern, and an elevated forecastle deck with anchor and mooring devices in the bow. Between these deck structures are four or five large cargo hatches. The cargo hatch is a rectangular opening in the deck above the hold. You look into it, it becomes scary, but the cargo hold is so deep. It is good that the hatch is fenced on all sides with walls up to 600 mm high. Such a fence is called a cargo hatch combing. The combing increases the strength of the deck, broken at the cutout. But the main task of the combing is to prevent water from getting inside the hold during a storm. Hatch covers serve the same purpose. They consist of thick wooden luchin shields stacked tightly together on the hatch combing. Two more layers of tarpaulin are pulled over them. And the wave is no longer so terrible for the cargo in the hold. Cargo is not just thrown into a deep hold. It is carefully lowered on a steel cable, a cargo pendant. This is done with the help of cargo booms and winches. An arrow is a thick log or steel pipe. With one end, a spur, it rests against the mast, and the other is raised up so that the arrow looks like a bow near a tree. The arrow can turn on the spur and, in addition, can tilt down and lift up, with the help of a special cable, toponent. A block is fixed at its upper end, through which a cargo pendant is passed. At the end of the pendant lowered into the hold there is a hook for capturing the cargo, and the other end goes to the winch, where it is wound on its drum. When the load is hooked, the winch is launched. The load rises to the top of the boom, then the boom is turned to the side with the help of a steel cable braces until the load hangs over the pier. The boom is rotated until the load hangs over the pier. Each hatch has two arrows and two winches. This is so that you can work from each side or from one side, but so as not to waste time turning the arrows. When working with two booms on board, one boom falls out overboard, and the other is installed above the hatch, and the load is transferred from one boom to another during lowering. With the help of an arrow, you can lift a load weighing up to 5 tons at a speed of 25 meters per minute. Some heavy lifting vessels have one or two more booms with a lifting capacity of up to 50 to 60 tons. And sometimes cargo cranes are installed. The cargo hatch is a rectangular opening in the deck above the hold. 1. Hatch combing, 2. Hatch cover, hollow, 3. Brackets handles, 4. Tarpaulin, 5. Mortgage bar, 6. Duck, 7. Wedge, 8. Storm mount. The holds of cargo ships can accommodate a variety of goods, all kinds of goods in boxes, sugar and flour, in bags, coal, or and grain, in bulk, machinery, equipment. Of particular concern is the transportation of timber on ships. For this, special cargo ships are being built, timber carriers. They must have spacious holds, large cargo hatches and a sufficiently free deck to load timber on it as well. It turns out that the lightness and large volume of timber cargo do not allow to fit all the timber into the holds, which the ship can take by weight. Therefore, approximately one-third of the timber cargo is stacked directly on the deck, at the height of a one-story house. To do this, ladders, fan heads and other items are removed from the upper deck. Wooden racks are fixed vertically at the sides, preventing the cargo from falling into the water. In addition, the cargo is tightly tied from side to side with steel cables. Each hatch has two arrows. 1. Mast, 2. Arrow, 3. Cargo pendant, 4. The upper block of the cargo pendant, 5. Cargo hook, 6. Winch, 7. Guy, 8. Thrust bearing, 9. The lower block of the cargo pendant, 10. Toponent. We already know that the higher the cargo is located on the ship, the worse its stability. With a large overload, the ship can tilt so much that the entire timber from the deck will fly into the water, despite all its fastening. 
That is why on timber carriers and with a full load they take ballast water into a double bottom. And for other trucks, this is done only when they go empty, without cargo. At the timber carrier, one third of the cargo is laid directly on the deck. Since the timber carrier takes part of the cargo on deck, a special load line has been developed for it and it is allowed to have a smaller freeboard than other ships. This is understandable, as such a load as timber increases the buoyancy of the timber carrier when, in stormy weather, a wave floods the deck. Of course, conventional cargo ships can also be used to transport timber. Only liquids and perishable products cannot be transported by an ordinary cargo ship. For this, special ships are built. On the sea, more often than other ships, you can see cargo ships. You won't find any here, from a small one, for 1,000 tons, to a giant carrying 40,000 tons of cargo. Worldwide, for every 100 transport ships, only three are passenger ships. The rest are all trucks. The cargo steamer does not go very fast. It can be compared to a truck. Of course, the truck cannot keep up with the fast Volga and ZIM, but on the other hand, it lifts and transports 2 to 5, or even 25 tons of cargo at once. So is a cargo ship, it is already considered fast if it has a speed of 14 to 16 knots. He is sometimes called the worker of the sea. There are many such workers in our Soviet fleet. Day and night they carry out their modest and at the same time important labor watch. They bring timber from Arkhangelsk, fish from Murmansk, bread from Odessa, cars from Leningrad. They are the main means of communication with such distant regions of our motherland as Sakhalin, Kamchatka, Chukotka. They deliver valuable cargo to the fraternal peoples of the people's democracies, China, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, and Albania. The workers in the ports of those countries where capitalism still reigns and oppresses people are happy to meet our cargo ships. Here our workers of the seas are not just steamships, in the holds of which there is bread or cars with the mark of the USSR. They are the heralds of peace and freedom, the messengers of the country of socialism. Messengers of the country of socialism. In the autumn of 1951, a catastrophe broke out in the valley of the Italian Po River, and the river overflowed its banks and rushed along the valley, flooding cities and villages, fields and gardens, highways and railways. The most fertile valley of Italy became a deep swamp. Many thousands of families were left without housing and food. They needed immediate help. And the Soviet people provided this assistance. The steamer Tamiryazev brought from Odessa to Italy a lot of food, seed wheat, tractors, agricultural machines. This is how the working people of Italy met the sailors of the Tamiryazev. On December 23, 1951, the Tamiryazev entered the port of Genoa. As soon as they moored, a huge crowd of people gathered at the side of the steamer, and there were port dockers, workers and employees of city enterprises, officials of institutions and delegations of residents of flooded areas. On the walls of the port buildings and in the hands of the greeters, bright posters were everywhere, on which the precious word peace was inscribed. Bouquets of red roses and carnations were on fire among women and children. Above the pier, the rumble of applause and cheers did not stop. The rally began immediately. A rally began at the side of the ship. One by one, ordinary Italian people went up to the podium to express the feelings that had gripped them from this meeting. Each of them spoke of his love for the USSR, of his burning hatred for the instigators of a new war. For a long time, Soviet sailors remembered the following words of an Italian woman, and this help is dear to us also because it came from the country of socialism, from the country of Lenin. Never, never will the Italian people fight against the Soviet people. We want, said the head of the Italian trade unions, Di Vittorio, that, as today, not warships, but ships of friendship and peace would come to our ports. Immediately after the rally, the unloading of gifts from the Soviet people began. The dockers of the port immediately declared that they would not take a single lira for this work. You just had to see with what enthusiasm they worked, and here is what the sailors from the ship Marshal Gavorov say. A ship was in the Tunisian port of Sfax. Once we, a group of Soviet sailors, were walking along the streets of the city. We were led by a volunteer guide, one of those many poorly dressed Arabs who spend their days hunting for a penny in arms. Usually, one cannot take a step here without seeing the outstretched hand. The inhabitants of African cities are forced to beg by terrible poverty and constant unemployment. We wandered around the city for a long time. A guide patiently took us to the most interesting places and diligently explained everything. Finally, the walk is over. It's time to get back to the ship. We warmly thanked our guide and offered him money, he honestly earned it. 
but the Arab took a step back from us, put one hand to his heart, and with the other removed the coins extended to him. No, he said, I won't take money from the Russians for anything. I am a simple, poor man, but I know well that the Soviets are friends of the Arabs. No, I won't take the money. I am also happy that I have become useful to my friends. He never took a penny from us. It is impossible to listen to the stories of the crew of the Soviet ship Archangels without excitement. An unforeseen circumstance forced the ship Archangels to deviate from its usual routes and make 12 voyages off the coast of Vietnam. At a meeting in Geneva, in the summer of 1954, an armistice agreement was signed in Vietnam. The agreement ended the war between the Vietnamese people and the imperialists. Many years of struggle brought freedom and independence to the heroic people. But only the northern half of Vietnam gained these benefits. The southern half, according to the Geneva Agreement, remained under the yoke of the imperialists. In this regard, tens of thousands of residents of the southern part wished to move to the north. In addition, it was necessary to remove from the jungle the regiments of the People's Army, forest, factories and plants, institutions located there. The most convenient route for such transportation was the South China Sea, washing Vietnam from the east, but the young republic did not have its own merchant fleet. Then Soviet ships came to the rescue. This is how the Archangelsk found itself off the coast of Vietnam and temporarily turned from a cargo ship into a passenger ship. The ship made its trips in very difficult conditions, with frequent storms, when the wind reached 10 points. Embarkation and disembarkation of passengers was carried out in open roads, 2 to 3 miles from the coast. Communication with the shore was maintained on fragile fishing boats. The boats were tossed high on the waves. They fought against the side of the ship, collided with each other. Many of the Archangel's passengers were injured or sick. There were many old people, women and children. Often, passengers had to be lifted from the boats to the deck by their hands, and then transferred to the hold of the ship. Soviet sailors put in a lot of work to convert the cargo holds into tolerable living quarters on their own. Almost all hours free from watch were spent by sailors in the holds, helping helpless passengers. In addition, there were many other concerns. It was necessary to organize food for several thousand people at once, to arrange medical care for the sick and wounded. Finally, we had to take care of the cultural recreation of our Vietnamese friends. The ship's radio operator was the first to distinguish himself, and passengers got the opportunity to listen to broadcasts in their native language. In the evenings, Soviet films began to be shown on the upper deck. Each film was met with great joy. And when the great leader of the working people, Lenin, appeared in the film Lenin in 1918, real jubilation reigned among the Vietnamese. At first, the pleasure from films was not complete, since the moviegoers did not understand the Russian language. But the sailors found a way out here too. They began to pre-record the translation of the entire text into Vietnamese on a tape recorder and transmit it during the demonstration of the film through a loudspeaker. It turned out something like dubbing a movie. Soviet sailors also distinguished themselves by amateur performances. Before that, she somehow did not get along on the ship. They tried to create it several times, and so they calmed down that there were no talents on the ship. And then suddenly talents showed up, one bayonist, two dancers, and twelve people of a good choir. The sailors were very worried before the first concert. How will his Vietnamese friends accept him? The fears were in vain. With great success, concerts were held in turn in each hold of the ship, while it was going to the North Vietnamese port of Koh Hoi. This is where passengers drop off. And again, there were exciting meetings. When the sailors appeared in the port, they were first surrounded by a dense crowd of children. A friendly conversation ensued. The guys laid out all their news and listened with bated breath to stories about the life of Soviet school children, about Moscow, a song about which they had just sung along with our sailors. After that, Soviet people fell into the arms of adult Vietnamese. And again the sailors were bombarded with questions. Leaving the shores of Vietnam, sailors took away many gifts from Vietnamese friends, as silk scarves and handkerchiefs, coconut cups, bamboo pipes and portraits of President Ho Chi Minh. He took away the ship and a huge elephant, a participant in glorious victories, who wore cannons. It was also a gift, from the heroic People's Army of Vietnam to the Soviet people. Archangels were seen off with thunderous cries of moon to us. Which means hooray. The familiar sounds of the beloved song Broad is my native land poured from all the loudspeakers of the port. And the Soviet sailors felt that they were leaving the country of true friends. The ship comes to port. 
After long months of sailing, the sea worker returns to his native port. A stone wall, they say, crosses the bay. On the side of it is a narrow passage. This is the port gate. From the bridge, the command of the watch assistant to the captain is heard, I prepare the anchor for return. The bosun and several sailors are already busy on the forecastle, near the anchor device. The anchor device is a whole economy. On the bow of the ship, two wide pipes pass through the deck. They come out with large holes on both sides of the bow of the vessel. These are anchors. Thick chains pass through them, at the ends of which huge anchors are suspended, sometimes weighing up to 30 tons. The length of each chain reaches 300 meters. With a special bracket, the chain is connected to the anchor spindle. The legs of the anchor can be rotated around the pivot shaft. When such an anchor falls to the bottom, its paws pierce into the ground, like a plowshare. A special machine is used to lift the anchor. She stands right there, on the forecastle deck, and they call her a windlass. The windlass pulls the anchor inside the hawse, only the legs stick out. At the windlass, four drums are planted on a horizontal shaft at once. Two of them with slots for anchor chain links. Such drums are called stars. Each sprocket can rotate independently of the other. Therefore, the windlass is able to work immediately on two anchors at the same time and on any of them separately. Two other, smooth drums can work in the same way. Each of these drums can pull the cable when mooring the vessel to the pier. When the anchor is released, the chain runs freely over the windlass sprocket. Here the force of gravity of the anchor and chain acts. But then the command is given, a stop, poison the anchor. The bosun turns the brake handle, the brake bend tightly fits the windlass shaft, stops it, and the anchor chain lingers in the sprocket grooves. Anchor device. 1. Windlass, E2, anchor chain, E3, stopper, 4, chain pipes, 5, side clues, E6, anchor spindle, E7, anchor pause. The case of the windlass is only to choose anchors. But he should not keep the steamer on them during parking. The sea is sometimes so clear that the steamer cannot stand still. It is thrown from side to side, but the anchors are not allowed. The jerking of the chain can damage the windlass, so it is not the windlass that keeps the ship anchored, but special deck brakes, stoppers. The anchor chain is clamped in the deck stoppers, and the jerks are not transmitted to the windlass, but to the stopper, firmly connected to the ship's hull. While the anchor is drawn into the hawse, the chain is also on the stopper. And where are the hundreds of meters of chain when the anchor is raised? They are in a chain locker below deck. Actually, this is not a box, but a small compartment, partitioned into two compartments, for the chains of the right and left anchors. And now, when approaching the port, the bosun sent a sailor there to see if the anchor chains were tangled. The worker of the sea enters the port modestly, without any noise and solemn music. He announces his arrival only with a long beep. He is not welcomed on the shore by a large crowd of people who meet him. And he is heading not to the elegant pier, but to the pier at the warehouses of the port. Here is the port gate already behind. The captain commands, a small forward. The captain always himself goes to the bridge when a storm on the sea or a ship is in danger, when it comes or goes from the port. The watch officer turned the crank of the machine telegraphed, small. And immediately the call was answered. The pier is still far away but a slow move is given in advance. The steamer has too much acceleration. Rudder left, still left. There is a left-hand drive. And the helmsman quickly turns the wheel. Keep it up, keep it up. And the whole mass obeys exactly the movements of the steering wheel. The harbor is getting closer and closer. Stop, the captain commands. It immediately becomes quiet. Can't hear the machine running. The ship moves forward as if holding its breath. Drop anchor! With a roar, the anchor flies into the water, and after it, jumping on the windlass drum and the stopper, the chain rushes to the hawse. The chain has slowed down. This means that the anchor has fallen to the ground. The chain continues to run only from the weight of that part of it that hangs overboard. The bosun turns the handle of the stopper. The chain seemed to be broken and frozen. Turning around, the steamer moves astern to the pier. Someone on the shore waved his hand and threw a rope with a weight onto the ship, lightness. A strong steel rope was tied to the rope, a mooring cable, and people on the pier dragged it towards them. The rope was looped over a cast iron pedestal, and the other end was wrapped around the drum of the stern capstan on the steamer. 
The capstan is the same windlass, but with a vertical drum. The spire has gone. The capstan machine began to work, choosing a rope and pulling the stern to the shore. At the bow of the ship were also ready. From there, another rope was brought to the pier and pulled up with the help of a windlass. Finally, the board almost came close to the wall. To prevent the ship from moving back, the mooring cables, late, fixed to the bollards, paired pedestals on the deck. They lower the ladder. The sailors are already removing hatch covers, exposing the mouths of the holds. There's not a minute to lose. Parking in the port of the steamer is unprofitable. In the monthly plan that the captain receives, it is written, it to complete so many ton miles. When they calculate the fulfillment of the plan, they will take into account not only the tons of cargo transported, but also the distance traveled with this cargo. Extra hours of parking in the port means less miles traveled at sea. Moreover, for each hour of delay at the pier, they take a fine. After all, every sailor wants the honorary pennant of the Ministry of the Navy to fly on the mast of his ship. This is an award for winning the socialist steamboat competition. Now the loaders have already come to the ship. In the cargo hold, a sailor is waiting for them, the hold. He was sent to supervise the loading and, most importantly, to ensure that during loading the boxes or bags are stowed in accordance with the cargo plan, the cargo plan. So that it does not happen that the cargo to the farthest port will lie on top, and to the nearest one, from below. The cargo captain's mate also supervises the loading. Noticing something wrong, he shouts to the hold. Petrov, you're confusing loads again. Look, you are laying Yalta with Odessa. It is very important to properly stow the goods. Otherwise, you will have to unload at the very first port to the very bottom in order to get some 20 boxes, and then load everything back again. Hard work is in full swing in every hold. Vera, shouts the loader. This means that the sailor at the winch must lift the load. When the load, raised to the top of the boom, turns around and finds itself above the hatch, the command is again, Amina. And the cargo is lowered into the hold. This is how they accept general cargo, that is, one that is packed in containers, bags, boxes, barrels. Bulk cargo is loaded in a completely different way, or coal, grain. Here most often do without arrows and winches. And along the entire length of the pier, a bridge was built, as high as a house. And wagons are brought over the bridge, for example, with grain. From them, the grain is poured down the chute directly into the hold, or they load it with a transporter. A white tape is brought from the car to the hold. The belt, like a subway escalator, continuously moves along the windrows and pulls the grain on itself. And so, wagon after wagon, the hold of the ship is filled. There is even a smarter device. This is a floating grain pump, grain unloading. 1. Floating grain pump, 2. Hold of the vessel, 3. Suction pipes, 4. Grain elevator, 5. Air pump, 6. Supply pipe, 7. Bunker, 8. Belt conveyor, 9. Wagon. The grain pump is placed between the ship and the pier, and during unloading, the receiving pipes are lowered into the hold of the steamer. Then an air pump is started, which draws air into the pipes with such force that the grain is captured along with the air and rises up like a whirlwind. Grain flows like water from the hold into the bunker. And from the bunker, this flow is directed directly to the cars. When one car is full, another is put in its place. When loading grain onto a ship, everything happens the other way around. Loading of coal is carried out by whole wagons. The crane will pick up the wagon and overturn it over the cargo hatch of the ship. Grab cranes are often used to unload coal. Grab cranes are often used to unload coal. It's kind of like an excavator. Such a crane will grab coal in the hold with a ladle, take it to the pier, and pour it out as if from a bag. But now the loading is over, the holds are closed. The steamer gives a farewell whistle. Give mooring lines, choose an anchor. Now the windlass is working at full power, pulling the steamer to the stuck anchor. The anchor chain slowly creeps through the hawse. It is dirty, all in silt and clay. It is washed with a stream of water from a hose. The chain runs over the windlass sprocket and down into the chain box. Anchor painter! Shouts the bosun. This means that the chain has become vertical, the steamer has reached the anchor. Now it remains to turn his paws out of the ground. Two more minutes, and the paws of the anchor are shown from the water. The bosun blows his whistle and the captain commands. Small forward. The steamer, increasing its speed, leaves the harbor. 
the worker of the sea again took up watch. Happy sailing. What is a tanker? A tanker is a vessel for the transport of liquid cargo. It is divided by transverse and longitudinal bulkheads into independent compartments, tanks, and liquid cargo is pumped into each tank through pipes, like into a barrel, oil, kerosene, gasoline. Sometimes tanks are filled with cargoes that have nothing to do with oil, such as edible vegetable oils, sweet molasses or whale oil. A tanker does not need any booms, winches, or loaders to receive cargo. Powerful pumps pump oil through hoses and pipes. Small booms and winches are available only for feeding and receiving heavy hoses and sometimes for loading dry cargo into a special hold. The tanker is divided by bulkheads into many compartments. 1. Transverse bulkheads, 2. Longitudinal bulkheads, 3. Corfidams, narrow compartments not filled with cargo separating tanks from other rooms, 4. Pump rooms, 5. Dry cargo hold, 6. Engine room, 7. Navigation bridge, 8. Transitional bridge, 9. Living quarters, 10. Cargo pipeline. But there were times when oil was transported in barrels. It is very uncomfortable. The loading of barrels took a long time, and it was expensive. Mechanical winches were not yet used, and everything was loaded manually, on ropes. No one could think of a better way to transport oil. So it was in the middle of the last century. Somehow, barrels of oil were loaded onto the Alexander sailing ship. The owners of this vessel, the Artemiv brothers, were right there, watching the loading. Here is one of the barrels, swaying strongly, slammed with all its might on the sharp edge of the hatch. From such a blow, she was shattered to smithereens. A puddle of spilled oil accumulated at the bottom of the hold. She stayed for several hours. And the Artemiv brothers noticed that the puddle was not shrinking at all, it remained the same as it was. What's the curiosity? Everyone was sure that part of the puddle must necessarily seep through the wooden bottom. But this did not happen. And the Artemivs understood, water does not accept oil. They had a brilliant idea, why not pour oil instead of barrels directly into the hold? They did just that, and the world's first oil tanker appeared. This important invention was greeted with ridicule, and here are eccentrics. Invented to water the Caspian Sea with oil. It is full of it without it. But the Artemivs did everything in their own way. They achieved that their vessel began to turn around twice as fast as the others. It was only then that the scoffers understood the full significance of the Artemiev's invention and also abandoned the barrels. But the ship Alexander was not yet a real tanker. It had a wooden body. An oil product such as kerosene freely seeped through the hull, above the load waterline. There was a lot of cargo leakage. The hold of this vessel has not yet been divided into small compartments, tanks. Such a ship was especially hit during a storm in the Caspian Sea. A huge mass of oil, freely pouring from side to side when the ship was rocking, hit the whole connection with force. The blows loosened the body and violated its strength. It could topple over at any moment. Only in 1878 a tanker appeared on the Caspian Sea with a steel, oil-tight hull and small compartments, tanks. It was called, a Zoroaster. It was the first oil tanker in the world. But even it still had little resemblance to modern tankers. The prototype of a modern tanker is the oil-loading steamer Spazitel, which began operating in the Caspian Sea in 1882. Since then, the development of the tanker has gone far ahead. The compartments of the Zoroaster could hold 250 tons of cargo, and a modern tanker can hold 45,000 tons. But this is not the limit, and now they are building tankers and even more. The speed of the Zoroaster was 8 knots, and now the tanker goes twice as fast. At the Baltic shipyard in Leningrad, they began building new tanker steam turbine ships with a speed of 18 knots. These will be excellent tankers, taking on board 25,000 tons of fuel. In appearance, the tanker bears little resemblance to other vessels. The tanker bears little resemblance to other vessels. Its engine is always placed in the stern. There is a chimney right there. In the stern there is also a long superstructure. It contains the crew quarters, and from it to the middle superstructure and further, to the very bow, the deck is free. Only in the middle stretches a long low bridge with handrails. People walk through it. A tanker cannot do without this bridge. The vessel, filled with cargo, sits very low in the water, but the deck from the water is no more than 1 to 2 meters. Imagine now a person who is in a storm on such a deck. 
The first big wave will wash him overboard like a grain of sand, and on the bridge, holding onto the railing, he will pass calmly. Only take cold showers, the upper deck of the tanker is cluttered with tank hatches. There are a lot of them. This is not the same as on a dry cargo ship. There are four, five large hatches, according to the number of cargo holds. There are dozens of them on the tanker. And hatch combings are made much higher. This is so that the oil does not overflow onto the deck, and in the summer heat, when oil, like any liquid, expands, it would have somewhere to go. Steel covers are tightly pressed to hatch combings. Each lid has a viewing hole closed with a metal plug. Through it, they measure how much cargo is poured into the tank. When filling the tanks, air escapes through these openings. Without such holes, the air would remain in the tanks, compressed into a tight cushion. In the end, he would not have let the oil completely fill the tank. On the cover there is also a gas outlet pipe with an upper end curve downwards. It was placed for a reason. Displaced air leaves through it when the oil expands from heating, and enters when the oil cools or is pumped out of the tank. Tanks breathe through gas pipes. But when transporting kerosene, gasoline, alcohol, vapors are released, which, when mixed with air, form an explosive mixture. Therefore, for such cargoes, the vent pipes are made high, above the superstructures located nearby. Sometimes gases are vented through hollow masts. On very hot days, the deck of the tanker takes a shower. Above it, thick pipes with many small holes are installed along and across. Cold sea water is pumped through pipes. And water through the holes in the pipes abundantly waters the deck, lowering the temperature in the tanks. The question immediately arises, but what about the sides of the tanker? After all, they, too, are heated from the scorching rays of the sun. It turns out that a special device for cooling the sides is not required. It is enough to paint the sides in white or grey, this colour reflects the sun's rays well. All this is done in order to reduce the evaporation of oil products as much as possible. And this is very important. So, for example, it was found that during the Odessa Vladivostok voyage, a tanker carrying gasoline loses as much as 200 tonnes of cargo from evaporation. There is still a significant difference between a tanker and other cargo ships. It turns out that the tanker does not have a second bottom. Yes, the tanker does not need it. We already know that the second bottom does not let water into the vessel when the bottom gets a hole. A full tanker is not afraid of water. Most types of liquid cargo do not mix with water, as oil is lighter than water and will always be on top. Such a tanker will come to the port, and the pump will suck out all the liquid cargo from the tank. The turn will reach the water, the valves will close, and that's it. Yes, and the compartments of the tanker are small. From the fact that one of them will even be flooded with water, nothing bad will happen. Such a case was with the tanker, Soviet oil. He ran into an underwater rock and received a large hole in the bottom. For an ordinary cargo ship, this is a big problem. It would be immediately put in for repairs. And the tanker, Soviet oil, was allowed to make several more long trips, but they did not take cargo into the damaged tank. But under the engine room of the tanker, of course, they are satisfied with the second bottom. Water can cause a lot of trouble here. The tanker is loaded differently than other cargo ships. On those, cargo booms and winches are used, many people are involved in loading. The noise is above the holds. All you hear is, Evira, Mena, Obtain. When filling the tanker, no roar or screams are heard. Silence during loading. The entire deck is cluttered with hoses. The hoses are thick and heavy. But how can they be light if they are 400 to 600 millimeters in diameter? Sometimes such hoses are lowered directly into the hatches of tanks, and most often they are connected to the intake and outflow pipeline. This pipeline is arranged in the form of a ring, which stretches along the bottom from the starboard and port sides, and closes at the ends of the vessel. From the side branches of the ring, two branches extend into each tank. The ring pipeline is connected to the ship's pumps. Such an arrangement of an oil pipeline is very convenient. Oil can be supplied to one or more tanks, and the rest can be turned off. You can simultaneously pump and pump oil from tanks. Finally, any of the tanks, if desired, can be filled with sea water and then removed. You ask, but how to close and open the valves of this pipeline if they are in a tank flooded with oil? It turns out that this can be done with the help of vertical rollers coming from the valves to the upper deck. Here the rollers end with flywheels. 
By rotating the flywheel, we control one or another valve directly from the upper deck. Other pipes with coils are laid between the pipes of the ring pipeline. Steam is passed through them to heat the cargo. It turns out that not all petroleum products can be kept cold in tanks. For example, fuel oil requires heating up to 50 degrees. If you don't warm it up, there will be trouble, it will freeze, and the pump cannot pump out such fuel oil. Large cargo pumps cannot pump all the cargo. When there is little cargo left, its level is below the receiving pipe. The pump is running at full speed, and the pipe with a strong whistle captures only air. To clean up tanks, a special system is made with small diameter pipes. As you can see, loading and unloading oil is a complicated and troublesome business. Long before arriving at the port, the tanker crew is preparing for this operation. The port authority is informed when the tanker will arrive, what cargo and in which tanks it will accept. The port should also prepare properly. Manhole covers are opened on the tanker, all pipes and valves are carefully examined, pumps are tested. Here is the port. The tanker is moored close to the pier and waits until it is connected by hoses to the onshore pipeline. Then the mooring lines will be loosened, slowed down, and the tanker will move away from the berth by the second of much meters. This is done for fire safety. And then a strong pump pumps oil from shore tanks. The speed of loading and pumping oil from the tanker is very high. For a tanker with a cargo of more than 20,000 tons, it takes only 4 to 5 hours. But it is not always so convenient to load a tanker. There are places for loading and unloading. If it is shallow, then a tanker sitting deep in the water cannot approach them. Then the stations for supplying and receiving oil are taken far out to sea. And this is how it is done, the pipeline is laid along the bottom at a distance of 2 to 3 miles from the coast. This pipeline ends with a flexible hose. From it, a cable comes out to the surface of the sea, to which a buoy is attached. A telephone wire was also connected to the buoy for negotiations with the shore. The tanker approaches the buoy, lifts the flexible hose onto the deck. Then he contacts the shore by phone, and the loading begins. I had to observe such loading of oil in the port of the city of Oka, the center of the oil industry of Sakhalin Island. Loading and unloading oil require good knowledge of the tanker crew. It is not easy to understand the multitude of all sorts of pipes, valves, gates. Often a tanker carries several different oil products at once. You can just mix heavy fuel oil with light kerosene in tanks, or you pump salt water into a tank with gasoline from behind the side. But loading the tanks is only half the battle. We still need to safely deliver the goods to their destination. This does not mean violent storms, fogs and shallows. All this is familiar to sailors and other ships. In a tanker, the cargo itself poses an additional danger. Danger awaits at every turn. When a tanker enters the port, a red flag is hoisted from its mast. This is done during the day, and at night a bright red light comes on at the top of the mast. This is a signal that there is a tanker in the port. Be aware of the great danger. What is she in? The fact is that petroleum products emit harmful fumes. These vapors can be poisonous. And they can cause an explosion. As long as the tanker is full of cargo and the tank lids are tightly closed, there is no big threat. Worse when tanks are empty. Then they are filled with an explosive mixture of oil vapors and air. Through the inspection holes in the hatches along the cargo pipes, this mixture can break out and spread throughout the tanker. She persistently seeks to climb into every corner, into every crack. It finds especially favorable conditions in those rooms that are poorly ventilated. She hides in them and waits for an opportunity. Many people think that only tanks are dangerous. But this is not true. There is not a single safe place on the tanker if the established rules are violated. Poisoning, explosion, fire can then be expected in any cabin, in the engine room, in the holds and other rooms. A great struggle is being waged against this danger. And here scientists have thoroughly helped. They have placed in the hands of the sailors many remarkable instruments which detect and destroy the hidden enemy. Here, for example, is a gas analyzer. This device instantly determines whether there are harmful vapors in the room and how many of them. The gas analyzer is usually located in the wheelhouse, on the bridge. Thin tubes stretch to it from all the premises of the ship. And through the tubes, air is sucked into the device from each room. If there are harmful vapors in the incoming air, they immediately light up in the device. And next to it is an electric wire. 
From the heat of the burning vapors, it heats up, and its heat is transferred to a special scale of the device. The scale is arranged in such a way that it directly shows in percentage terms how many vapors are in a particular room. So, without leaving the wheelhouse, the captain's officer on duty finds out what kind of air is in the tanker's premises, whether it is safe or threatens to poison people, explosion, fire. To explode or catch fire, a tanker needs very little, a cigarette butt, a burning cigarette, and even a small spark can cause a catastrophe. It is hard to serve on a tanker for inveterate smokers. There should be no cigarettes, no matches, no lighters in their pockets. There are special rooms for smoking. They are so insulated and ventilated that it is difficult for harmful vapors to get here. Here smokers and cigarettes and electric lighters are at the service. Smoked, go to work, just don't forget to leave your cigarette but in the smoking room. Forgetting means committing a serious crime. And in other places of the tanker, smoking is strictly prohibited. There is no place for scattered people on the tanker. Even the galley does not work during the loading of gasoline, gasoline vapors are especially dangerous. People wear soft shoes to avoid sparks from nails in the heels when they hit the deck. The modern tanker is fully electrified. This is good. But how much extra trouble and worries electricity brings to the crew of the tanker? It poses many dangers. Malfunction of electrical wires, plugs, switches, inept handling of devices gives a short circuit of the current, which means an explosion of accumulated vapors and a fire. A spark slipped when the electric motor was turned on, again expect trouble. This is what happened one day because of an electric spark. The tanker loaded with oil was about to leave for the sea. The bosun with several sailors were preparing a device for lifting anchors. They tried to pump water to wash the anchor chains from adhering dirt, but the pump refused to work. Then the bosun sent one sailor to the pump room. It was dark there. It looks like the light bulb has burned out, thought the sailor. He unscrewed the bulb and shook it. Hair seems to be fine. The sailor put the bulb back in place, but it did not light up. What's happened? Maybe there is no current, thought the sailor. He unscrewed the bulb again and jabbed some kind of piece of iron into the socket. A short spark flashed. Then, one after the other, there were two explosions. Like a projectile, the heavy steel cover of the dry cargo hold, which was located next to the pump room, shut up, and behind it a huge column of flame and smoke rose to the sky. Why did the spark turn out in the pump room, but the dry cargo hold caught fire? It turned out that the explosion of oil vapors in the pump room tore out the wall separating this compartment from the dry cargo hold. Vapors also accumulated in the hold. A second explosion followed, and the hold caught fire. The fire was quickly extinguished. The fire did not have time to reach the tanks, otherwise the tanker would not have escaped death. About 30 years ago, the entire deck of a tanker was littered with various cartridges, switches and plugs. All this was necessary to illuminate the deck during the night loading of oil. And all this threatened the safety of the tanker, a look, when you turn it on, a spark will jump. Now it's different. On the aft superstructure and in the bow there are powerful spotlights that flood the deck with bright light. On the tanker, even the boats are steel, not wooden. And they are suspended not on hemp, but on steel cables. The boats have special shields to protect people from the flames of burning oil spilled on the surface of the sea. But what about wooden oars in this case? After all, they can burn. And it is provided. A shaft passes inside the boat, on which there is a manual drive in the form of levers. By setting these levers in motion, it is possible to rotate the shaft with the propeller and thereby move the boat. That's how many different means are used on a tanker to avoid explosion and fire. And if a fire does occur, there will be good means to extinguish it. Among them there are those that can be found on other ships, for example, carbon dioxide. It is fed through pipes directly to the fire site. Sometimes foam is used, which is obtained from the action of acid on a soda solution. The foam spreads evenly over the surface of the burning oil. This layer blocks the flame from the oxygen of the air, and without oxygen there is no combustion. A few centimeters of such a layer is enough to extinguish the fire. And what is important, the foam acts for several hours until the fire disappears. To extinguish burning oil, special water spray heads are also used. These heads spray a jet of liquid, forming a water mist above the flame. Water dust falls on burning oil and turns into steam. Thus, it absorbs heat from the burning oil, 
and the resulting steam isolates the oil from the air, and this causes the fire to go out. Recently, tankers have received an even stronger fire extinguishing agent. Imagine the unbelievable, as someone on a tanker lit a torch and shoved it through a hatch into a tank of oil. Now disaster will happen. The tanker itself must turn into a huge torch. But what is it? To your surprise, none of this happens. Oil that can catch fire from the slightest spark does not ignite. At first glance, this seems incredible. Oil has lost the ability to catch fire. It's like we set the ice on fire. Everyone knows that any substance can burn when it is surrounded by air. The thinnest metal hair will burn in the air so quickly that you do not have time to blink an eye. Now let's put this hair in an electric light bulb. The hair will glow for months. This happens because air is pumped out of the light bulb or there is gas in it that does not support combustion in any way. If the space above the oil is filled with this gas, for example, nitrogen, then it will not ignite, even if a fire is made in the tank. But where can we get enough gas to fill all the cargo compartments of a tanker? What a huge amount of money it will cost. It would be nice to have cheap and plentiful gas. And such a gas was found. These are gases from the combustion of fuel in the boiler or exhaust gases from the ship's engine. It turns out that they deprive the oil of the opportunity to catch fire. They are called inert gases. To put such gases into action does not require special complex equipment and high costs. All that is needed is a special chamber where the inert gases, before filling the tanks, must be cooled and cleared of incandescent particles. A lot of care is needed to ensure the safety of the tanker. The sailors of the Soviet oil loading fleet know their business well. They perfectly mastered the latest techniques for dealing with dangerous oil vapors and fires. Therefore, sailing on a tanker is as safe as on any other ship. Floating, cold factory. Try pouring a little cologne on your hand and blow on a wet spot. You will feel a chill on your hand. The secret behind this cologne property is simple. The chill is obtained because the cologne evaporates and takes heat from the human body. All liquids have the ability to cool by evaporation. Only some evaporate faster and cool more strongly, while others are slower. Water is not as volatile a liquid as, for example, ether or alcohol. Therefore, its evaporation is slower. But in the summer, it is always colder than air in an earthen jar. Liquid carbon dioxide evaporates so quickly that the non-evaporated part of it turns into ice. This property of liquids makes it possible to artificially obtain cold. How is it done? In the chambers where perishable products are stored, meat, butter, eggs, fish, fruits, special curved pipes are installed like steam radiators. Evaporating liquid is pumped through these pipes. Evaporating, the liquid cools the pipes from the inside so that they are covered with frost on the outside. Having a refrigeration or refrigeration unit on the ship, you don't have to worry, the products will always be fresh, as long as the unit works properly. Cooling chambers are now available on every long-distance vessel. You can't do without these cameras. Previously, they got out of the situation simply, and they took on the road only those products that did not require special storage, a crackers or biscuits, salted meat, corned beef, various canned food, and ate these stocks. Sometimes they took live cattle and poultry with them, but this did not last long. And now let the steamer sail for at least two months, every day for dinner there will be borscht not with corned beef or canned food, but with fresh meat. If you want fish soup or fresh fried fish, please. Butter for breakfast will be brought solid, not rancid, and fresh apples, pears, grapes will be served for sweets. When the cook goes to the refrigerator for meat or other products, it is just right for him to wear a short fur coat and warm mittens. And there are steamships that do nothing but carry perishable goods over long distances. They are called refrigerated ships. They have cargo holds, as well as refrigerating chambers, of a special device. Refrigerated ships have special holds. The sides, decks and bulkheads of these holds, in order to reduce the influx of heat, are covered with a layer of insulation made of pressed cork boards, which are sheathed with boards or plywood. Recently, other materials have been used instead of cork, such as aluminum foil. Which of the liquids is used to obtain artificial cold? Ammonia was once used on refrigerated ships. But ammonia is a very poisonous gas. 2% of it in the air is already fatal to humans. And on a ship, when rolling, pipes loosen and through leaks in their connections, ammonia vapor can penetrate into the premises. Therefore, ammonia was abandoned and carbon dioxide was used. 
but carbon dioxide is also dangerous to humans, and it is even more difficult to detect than ammonia. Then, in order not to supply dangerous gas into the holds at all, they began to cool them with brine, consisting of a solution of salts in water. Such a solution does not freeze even at a temperature of 20 degrees below zero. The brine itself is cooled in special evaporators. In them, the cooled brine passes through the tubes. And outside the tubes, gas evaporates, ammonia, carbon dioxide or freon. Then a special pump drives the cold brine through the cooling batteries of the cargo holds. The heated brine returns to the evaporator again. Instead of brine, sometimes cold air is used, which is supplied by special fans through the cooler to the cargo holds. Air is especially convenient in those cases when too low a temperature is not needed and even harmful for perishable goods. After all, a refrigeration unit can create a frost of 10 to 15 degrees in the hold, but such a cold is not useful for every cargo. This is good for fish and meat, but such a temperature is disastrous for an egg. Who needs a frozen egg? Frost is not needed at all for fruits. On the contrary, they require 1 to 4 degrees of heat. Each product needs its own specific temperature to be stored. She must be monitored throughout the voyage of the vessel. But how to do that? After all, the cargo holds are tightly closed. To do this, earlier in the holds there were temperature tubes. Their holes came out of the hold to the outside. We need to find out the temperature of the hold. A thermometer was lowered into the tube and waited for several minutes. The thermometer showed whether everything was safe in the cargo hold. A high temperature means something is wrong with the refrigeration unit. The temperature is too low, which means that the brine goes into the hold too cold. Now the permanent thermometers in the holds are connected to special indicators in the refrigeration department, so that you do not even need to go to the hold to measure the temperature. It would be nice if the temperature in the cargo holds was always maintained at the temperature required by the cargo. People have thought of this before. The refrigerated vessel has automatic devices that regulate the cooling and the flow of brine or air into the hold. It became too warm in the hold, the machine itself is activated. He instantly turns on the refrigerator. The desired temperature will be established in the hold, and the machine will turn it off again. Refrigerated ships receive perishable goods from port refrigerators in frozen or chilled form. The ship's refrigeration plant only stores cargo. And there are also steamships where the cargo is completely processed and frozen. These are freezer ships serving our fishing and whaling fleets. On such ships, refrigeration units are more powerful, since they need not only to remove heat penetrating from the outside from the holds, but also to quickly remove it from incoming fresh meat or fresh fish. In the old days, fishing boats, leaving for fishing, took with them stocks of ice and salt. Caught fish was sprinkled with pieces of ice and salt. This is how they tried to keep the catch from damage and decay. Then the fishing boats began to go fishing farther and farther. This way of storing fish was no longer good. The ice melted and the fish spoiled. Now ship freezers can freeze 100 tons of whale meat or fish per day. These are the floating cold factories in the modern fleet. The first refrigerator ship in Russia appeared in 1888 on the Volga. It was a barge with artificial cooling of cargoes. Before the revolution, perishable goods were also transported by sea. Many of them were exported abroad. From St. Petersburg, Riga and other ports, ships with butter, eggs, caviar, meat, fish and fruits left for different countries. But almost all of these ships were foreign. Before the revolution, not a single marine refrigerator ship was built in Russia. If they were, they were bought abroad. When it was necessary to export perishable goods from our country, most often they resorted to the services of foreign ship owners. It was only in Soviet times that we began to build refrigerated ships. These are large diesel electric vessels, beautiful, fast and roomy. High speed and capacious refrigerators are being built at Soviet shipyards. Fish factory on the high seas. The Barents Sea unfriendly met a small ship. A nine point wind roared furiously in the rigging. Foam smoking lead great water billows crashed down on the trawler. He then took off up, then failed, heeled sharply to the left, then to the starboard side. Huge streams of water hissed over the deck. But fishermen are not afraid of these follies of the sea. They know that good weather cannot be expected in these parts, and the country demands to get as many fish as possible. Even the day before, the captain of the trawler received a radio report from the trawl fleet management, which indicated in which area of the sea there were fish and in which direction their shoals were moving. 
The watch navigator put all the data of the report on a special drawing tablet. A trawler approached this area. The trawler approached the fishing area. Now we need to check the summary. Here much depends on the knowledge and experience of hydroacoustics, the owner of the echo sounder. It requires a subtle sophisticated ear, the ability to read echograms as freely as one reads a book. It is necessary to quickly detect a fish school under the keel of a trawler, determine the density and depth of its immersion, and even the type of fish, cod, herring or haddock. But the hydroacoustic officer reported to the captain that a huge school of cod had been found at a depth of 250 meters. The captain turns the engine telegraph knob to stop. The download starts even more. The trawler abruptly turns sideways to the wind and drifts. From the side, they will now dump a trawl into the water, a large oval bag from the net. On the move of the vessel, special space aboards, under the action of tension towing ropes warps, will become vertical and stretch the trawl bag across the movement of the vessel. This is how this giant seine will move at great depths, opening its mouth wide to meet the swimming fish. This is how a giant seine moves at great depths, opening its mouth wide. The cod will fall into such a wide and deep throat, and it will no longer escape from the bag. After launching the trawl, the captain gives the command low speed. The trawler turns around again and begins to pull the trawl bag behind it until the fish are filled with it. This goes on for two hours. These hours seem long amid intense attention and impatience. Sometimes fishermen even forget about the sea raging around. Give away the stopper! These two jerky words of the command always excite the fishermen. This is the signal to start lifting the trawl. The winch roared again. The warps began to move again, winding on the winch drums. Thin white strings of bubbles scatter from them along the water. A semicircular chain of floats coctilli swayed on the surface of the water, slowly approaching the side of the ship. Each of the fishermen has the same thought, what if the sonar failed? What if, instead of an abundance of cod, they see all sorts of picturesque things among the rope web of the bag, red starfish, urchins, jellyfish and, as if in mockery, a few small fish? What can you do? It happens. But an overly heavy bag also sometimes causes disappointment. Once such a troll was lifted on board, and it suddenly burst. It turned out that two huge stones hit him. Therefore, capron threads are now used for troll nets, which are five times stronger than hemp threads. But then the water boiled, and the top of the troll flashed. With the help of special cables thrown over the blocks on the mast, it is raised. A tightly stuffed trawl bag slowly creeps along the smooth side plating. He is hooked and dragged, with difficulty turning over the bulwark. Finally, the bag flops heavily onto the boarded deck. One of the fishermen unlaces the knot. And a swaying mountain of cod spills onto the deck in a swift stream. A swaying mountain of cod spills onto the deck in a swift stream. The trawler's fish factory immediately comes into operation. The cutting of fish begins on several tables installed directly on the open deck of a rocking vessel. The work goes under a deafening concert of furious waves. Burns the bone-chilling wind. But this does not bother the fishermen. The fish, like on a conveyor belt, is passed from hand to hand by the dividers. The first divider decapitates the fish with a deft movement of the knife. The second, rips open the belly. The third one carefully removes a pinkish-white liver from his belly and puts it in a can. The fourth, throws the butchered fish onto an inclined chute that goes into the hold. In the hold, the fish is salted, and then cooled, sprinkling the cod laid in bulk with finely crushed ice. Sometimes there is also a special installation for freezing fish, and on large trawlers there is a small fat melting and canning workshop. The whole fish is being processed. Even her waist does not disappear, a head, bones, entrails. They are dried, crushed, and nutritious flour is obtained from them, for animal feed. Trawler fishermen work equally well in rare calm weather and in a storm. They work on an open deck that leaves from under their feet, risking every moment to find themselves overboard. Once the advanced trawler, Stalingrad returned to the port of Murmansk after a long voyage. He overfulfilled the annual catch plan long before the end of the fishing season. Murmansk residents came to congratulate the ship's crew on a great victory. They were interested in how the fishermen managed to achieve such success. During the conversation, the captain of the trawler pointed towards the bow of the vessel. See how the handrails of the gangway have folded over? It's all done by the storm. He managed to bend the metal, but the Soviet fisherman did not bend from his blows. 
Until recently, the trawler was considered an achievement of fishing technology. But what yesterday seemed like a miracle of technology is already getting old today. The 20th Congress of our Communist Party set before the Soviet fishermen the following task, to catch much more fish and deliver it from the sea, mainly in the form of finished products. It is necessary that fishermen do not transfer their catch to fish processing plants, but load it in the port directly into wagons to be sent to shops in cities and villages of our country. It is clear that for almost all existing fishing vessels such a task is impossible. It was necessary to create real floating fish factories, equipped with powerful refrigeration units and machines for the complete processing of fish. Such trawlers already exist in Merman's fishing fleet. In July 1955, a completely unusual fishing vessel, Pushkin, moored at the key wall of the Murmansk port. It was a very large and at the same time graceful trawler, reminiscent of a white-winged gull. It did not in any way resemble those trawlers that stood at the berths and on the roadstead of the port. Its displacement is 3,670 tons, while for conventional trawlers it is only 1,100 tons. The main engine of this ship has a power several times greater than that of an ordinary trawler, about 2,000 horsepower, and it is not located in the stern, as usual, but in the middle. The new trawler can leave the shore for two months without needing to replenish fuel and provisions, and he has one more feature that greatly distinguishes him from all other fishing vessels. This is a rectangular stern, ending with an inclined platform, a slip, which descends directly into the water. The stern of the new trawlers ends with an inclined platform, a slipway, along which the trawl pulls out. Such a stern provides an advantageous opportunity to lower the trawl not from the side, as with conventional trawlers, but from the stern. At first glance, this seems strange, but does it matter how to lower it? It turns out that there is a difference, and a very big one. Trawling from the side is a long and tedious job due to a lot of fuss with many auxiliary lines. It takes whole hours. When stern trawling, the trawl bag is lowered into the water and pulled onto the deck along the slipway without any hassle. The descent and ascent of the trawl takes no more than 40 minutes. During side trawling, the descent and recovery of the trawl is carried out with the vessel's machines locked, and during stern trawling, on the move. With a large catch, the fish processors of a conventional trawler cannot cope with their work. The trawler has to drift until all butchered fish are removed from the deck. The new trawler has no such delay. Looking closely at the new trawler, we notice another innovation, it turns out that, in addition to the bow, like all ships, there is also a stern command cabin. From here they control during the descent and ascent of the trawl on the go. The working conditions of fish processors have especially changed on the new trawler. All fish processing has been moved from the upper deck to the closed lower deck. Here people do not experience the furious blows of the storm. Only the dull sound of the raging sea and the howling of the wind can be heard here. Here, as in any factory, it is dry and warm, bright electric lighting is everywhere. Fishermen go to work not in padded jackets salted with seawater, but in snow-white bathrobes. Fish processing is almost completely mechanized. Dozens of electric motors hum everywhere, buttons for controlling mechanisms shine, conveyor belts hurriedly run, loading elevators descend and take off, the arrows of precise measuring and signaling devices fluctuate. All mechanisms of the engine room, deck and refrigerating machines, fish processing machines are electrified. They are powered by a power plant with four diesel generators, and the power of each of them is equal to the power of the main engine of the old trawler. From emptying the trawl bag on the upper deck to loading all the processed fish into the freezers, it takes less than one hour. During this time, each fish managed to butcher. A special machine cut off her head. The ingenious filleting machine instantly measured the fish, automatically set its knives and quickly cut out all the bones, and cut the fish itself into two equal parts, fillets. And then the sirloins, having previously plunged into a special brine, find themselves in a 35 degree frost, in the freezer. Small fish are frozen in the form of pressed briquettes. On the trawler Pushkin there are also fat melting and canning shops. But they are much more powerful than the same workshops of a conventional trawler and are fully mechanized. The Pushkin trawler also has an automatic recycling machine, which produces as much feed flour in one trip as the old trawler received in a year. Now, Pushkin is no longer an outlandish vessel, and many such trawlers enter the expanses of the Barents Sea. We talked about trawlers, but not only trawls catch fish. And fishing vessels are also called differently. The fishing fleet consists of a huge number of vessels of various sizes and purposes. At the end of the sixth five-year plan, 32,000 self-propelled boats flying the Soviet flag will be fishing. The story of the flotilla, glory. 
Which of the guys has not heard of the whaling flotilla glory? Who has not admired the heroic work of the whalers? How hardy and fearless the sailors of the flotilla must be in order to endure the harsh conditions of the cold Antarctic for many months and carry out heavy fishing in any weather. Nowhere are whales as hard to find as they are in Antarctica, but nowhere are there so many whales. No wonder the whaling fleets of many countries rush here. Three quarters of the world's whale production comes from this area. The whale is a huge and very strong marine animal. Once, a wounded sperm whale attacked a whaling ship. With a blow to the head, he broke off the propeller blade and firmly bent the propeller shaft. The ship is out of order. As for the sperm whale, this audacity cost him nothing, a slight damage to the skin. The power of the muscular strength of a large baleen whale reaches 1500 horsepower. This roughly corresponds to the power of the main engine of an average steamer. This will not be surprising if you get acquainted with the size of the baleen whale. The length of its body reaches 30 meters, and its weight is 150 tons. More than 4 tons weighs one of his tongue. With the help of a horizontal tail fin, the whale develops a swimming speed of up to 24 knots. And only very few merchant ships have such a speed. Whale hunting in the old days was very dangerous. Whales were then beaten from small boats, whale boats. To kill a whale, it was necessary to get very close to it and, for sure, hit with a harpoon under the pectoral fin, where the heart is located. For the sake of such a convenient moment, the whale was pursued for many days, but this moment has come. A spear-like harpoon thrown with a strong hand. Its curved tooth tip is firmly embedded in the whale's carcass. A rope attached to the harpoon holds the wounded animal. The whale appears to be in tow. But usually the tugboat was not a whaling whaleboat, but, on the contrary, a whale. So he dragged the daredevil whalers along with him until he breathed his last from rifle shots. Sometimes the rope broke and the long exhausting struggle with the whale ended in vain. And it happened even worse, a wounded whale rushed onto the boat and turned it over with one blow of its tail. Many brave whalers found their death in the deep ocean. In our time, whaling ships have become different, and hunting techniques have become different. Now whales are hunted by whole fleets. For example, the Slava flotilla consists of a flagship floating base and 15 seaworthy whaling ships. A whaler is a single-deck vessel with a displacement of about 500 tons, specially adapted for whaling. He has only one, the middle superstructure. A platform with a harpoon gun is installed in the forward part of the deck. The current harpoon, weighing 60 kilograms, cannot be thrown by hand. In addition, it is more convenient to hit a whale from a long distance, from about 60 to 70 meters. A cast iron grenade is attached to the tip of the harpoon. When, after being fired from a cannon, the harpoon hits the whale's torso, the grenade explodes, killing or seriously injuring the animal. The explosion instantly reveals the four teeth of the tip. These teeth prevent the taut cable from tearing the harpoon tip out of the whale carcass. The cable is wound on the winch drum. Now it is no longer a whale, but a whaler is a towing vehicle. The wounded whale rushes from side to side, trying to get away, winding the cable from the winch drum but all his efforts are in vain. Some time will pass, the whale will run out of steam and calm down, then they pull it closer with a winch and finish it off with a killing shot. Then the carcass is inflated with air and left to float, placing their distinctive flag on it, and they themselves rush after the next whale. Now the first ships are taking part in the hunt, Soviet-built whalers. Soviet-built whalers take part in the hunt. These are seaworthy hunting vessels with a diesel electric installation of 3,600 horsepower, giving a speed of 18 knots. They are twice the size of the old ones. Whalers of the Mooney type turned out to be very maneuverable, they turn instantly and directly on the heel, and the move from full rear to full forward is changed in just 35 seconds. All this is very important when searching and chasing. But now the hunt is over, the whaler collects the dead whales and drags them in tow to the floating base of the flotilla. The base of the flotilla is a large steamship with a displacement of about 30,000 tons. He has two steam engines with a capacity of 4,000 horsepower each. It, like the Pushkin-type trawler, has a slipway in the stern. It will not be difficult to pull a 100-ton carcass onto the upper deck along the slipway with the help of a cargo winch. As soon as the whale carcass rolls over from the slipway to the aft section of the upper deck, the carvers immediately begin to work. After 40 to 45 minutes, nothing remains on the deck from a huge mountain of meat and bones. 
lard, bones and meat to send through deck hatches into the fat melting plant, where over 300 different mechanisms and devices operate. The purified fat is sent through pipes to tanks, tanks. The middle part of the floating base hull, like that of a tanker, is divided by transverse and longitudinal bulkheads into several dozen tanks. When the Slava flotilla leaves for fishing, all these tanks are filled with liquid fuel, black oil. A three-month supply of fuel is stored here for the operation of the boilers of the base and all the whalers of the flotilla. As the fuel oil is emptied, the tanks are loaded with blubber, feed meal and whale liver. But, of course, before they are cleaned of any traces of fuel oil, steamed and washed. Like the tanker, the aft part of the base is occupied by the engine and boiler room. Only the tanker usually has one deck, and the base has two, upper and lower. Between decks are compartments for processing whales. Here, in addition to the fat-burning plant, there is a cannery, a waste plant for the production of fodder meal from whale meat and bones. At the same plant, valuable vitamins are produced from the liver of a whale. There is also a powerful desalination plant nearby. For a day, it produces up to 200 tons of fresh water from the salty water of the ocean. All ships of the flotilla are supplied with this water. On the lower deck there are various warehouses, repair shops, residential and service premises. We need a lot of these spaces. After all, about 400 people live and work on the basis of the flotilla for the whole seven months. Here are the crew of the vessel, and workers of various specialties, and even a large group of scientists. The construction of a new Soviet whaling flotilla base has already begun. The displacement of this three-deck ocean-going vessel is almost one and a half times greater than the displacement of the glory, and the engine power will be 15,000 horsepower. It will be a fast vessel with a speed of 16 knots. This will be the new whaling base. All processing of whale raw materials at this base will be fully mechanized. For reconnaissance and whale hunting, the base will have a helicopter. For one Antarctic voyage, it will give our country 65,000 tons of various products. This is what a wonderful base the Soviet whalers will soon receive. In the meantime, let's get acquainted with the work of the existing Slava flotilla. Its conditions are well described by the captain director of the flotilla, Comrade Solyanik. The industry has arrived. Fog and blizzard greatly interfered with us. Snow tornadoes swooped in, and everything swirled around. Often from the bridge it was impossible to see what was happening on the stone. Here, hull and superstructures were covered with ice. The storm intensified. Gust after gust lifted long waves 20 meters high, tearing gray foam from them. The whalers fell from side to side, stood on end, exposing their keel, dug themselves up to the top of the mast in the abyss and reappeared on the crests of the waves. The clothes of the harpooner standing at the cannon were iced over, she crunched loudly at the slightest movement. It is not easy to shoot a cannon in such conditions, and even more difficult to hit a whale. The base of the flotilla is a large ship. But here, too, everything shakes during a storm. Bulkheads creak in the cabins, furniture shatters into chips, there are more broken dishes than at any wedding in the old days. At dinner, plates and cups slide across the table, and only a skilled juggler can bring a spoon to his mouth without spilling the soup. One by one, the whalers approach the base. The cutting shop, despite the terrible storm, did not refuse to accept the whales. And the wind kept getting stronger. He tore the cables, carried away heavy objects from the deck. The ship was healing 30 to 35 degrees. In the fight against a powerful enemy, whalers are exposed to various dangers. That's what happened to one whaler. After a long chase, he approached about 70 meters to the largest whale. The harpooner fired from the cannon, but unsuccessfully. Keith was slightly wounded. In these cases, they choose a cable with a winch, pull the whale closer to finish it off with a killing shot. But before they had time to start the winch, the whale himself rushed onto the ship. The whaler, fleeing from the blow, reversed. The whale, having described an arc around the stern of the vessel, dived into the water, spun and wound the cable around the propeller. Then he made two or three circles underwater, surfaced and rushed forward, dragging the whaler behind him stern forward. It is impossible to kill a whale with a killing shot, since the harpoon gun is tightly fixed in the bow of the ship. It is also impossible to release the screw from the cable. With the propeller idle, the whaler became a helpless barge being pulled along by an amazing tugboat. Just be patient and wait for help. 
there was enough patience, but the whalers were worried about something else, a lot of icebergs floated around the ship, huge ice mountains. Some of them were up to 100 meters long. They sat deep in the water. As soon as the whale dived under the nearest iceberg, it would all be over, the ship cannot avoid a fatal blow to the ice flow. But here comes help. Another whaler was rushing at full speed towards the prisoner. A harpoon cannon was fired at the whale from it. The harpoon only wounded the whale again. Enraged and still full of strength, the whale on two cables, as if on reins, already dragged two ships behind him, one for the stern, the other for the bow. This time, from the nose of the second whaler, it was possible to fire a finishing shot at a convenient moment. That moment came soon. A new shot finally killed the restless towing vehicle. This is one of many episodes of the hard and selfless work of Soviet whalers, which annually brings the state more than 100 million rubles in profit. 23,650 sea giants were caught by the whalers of the glory in 11 years. Having finished the whaling season, the sailors of the flotilla are confidently guiding their ships along the familiar road beaten for 11 years, from the eternal ice of Antarctica to sunny Odessa. In the port of Odessa, they are greeted like heroes by the lingering whistles of factories, plants and standing ships. And on the pier, a solemn meeting awaits with thousands of Soviet people, glorifying the hard, but honorable work of Soviet whalers. The ship is being towed. In every seaport, Besides large ships standing motionless at the moorings, small steamers can be seen scurrying back and forth. Here is one of them, shrouded in a cloud of smoke, barely dragging a long caravan of loaded barges. Here is another similar steamboat dragging a barge with fuel, fresh water or provisions to an ocean-going ship. While the sea giant fills his holds with cargo, he can at the same time stock up on everything he needs for a long voyage. How much the ship stay in the port is shortened by this. Sometimes steamboats help the floating giants to receive the main cargo as well. In the northern ports of our country, you can often see the following picture, in the middle of the raid there is an ocean-going timber carrier, and steamboats dragging barges with timber one after another to its side. These barges, before reaching the seaport, made a long journey along the river. And here is another picture from the life of the seaport. Two steamboats jumped up to the steel hulk moored at the pier. Black, white-sided, they resemble clumsy beetles crawling on the water. The steamboats took the ropes from the ocean-going ship. Then, puffing high chimneys, merrily calling to each other with horns, they dragged the steel giant to the exit of the port. One pulls the ship by the bow, and the other holds the stern of the ship so that it does not hit the pier or another steamer. And the sea giant slowly, as if reluctantly, turns around and obediently follows the little strong man. The sea giant dutifully follows the little strong man. All these steamboats are an important accessory of the port. They are called harbor tugs. Why are they so necessary for ocean-going ships? After all, these ships can move on their own. It turns out that the independent movement of a large vessel in the port is both dangerous and uneconomical. It is dangerous because it is difficult for him to turn around in the tightness of the port, a collision is quite possible, which means a severe accident uneconomical because you have to use a powerful engine for maneuvering at low speeds. The displacement of the port tug is 100 to 200 tons, and the power of its car is 200 to 500 horsepower. As you can see, the port tug has quite a lot of power with a relatively small hull size. And this is no coincidence. Thanks to this feature, the tugboat can pull very large vessels and maneuver perfectly in the tightness of the port. A port tug is always built with a certain slope, trim, to the stern. This improves its agility. In addition, you can put a large propeller and thereby increase the power of the tug. A port tug is more likely than other vessels to lose stability due to strong traction and sharp rope jerks during towing. To improve stability, the hull is made wider. When maneuvering, a port tug has to change course very often and make immediate turns. Every second is precious here. Every moment you can collide with another ship or pier. Therefore, on port tugs, you can most often find remote control of the main engine. With such control, all tug maneuvers are carried out directly from the captain's bridge. One press of a button is enough, and the forward stroke of the tug is instantly replaced by a reverse one, the full stroke is reduced to a small one, and the towing rope is instantly given. This control is best suited to a tug with a diesel-electric installation. After all, this installation is always ready for immediate action, which is very important for a tug. During operation, the tug often collides with other ships or shore facilities. 
Can you imagine what a crumpled look his body should have? In fact, the tug does not have any damage. Maybe his body is made of some kind of heavy duty armor? Nothing like this. The thickness of the steel sheathing of the hull of the tug is not more than 8 millimeters. The fact is that the force of impacts during collisions is assumed not by the side of the vessel, but by the fender. This is a special piece of wooden beams that stretches at deck height from bow to stern, from both sides of the tug. The bow and stern of the tug are also protected from impacts by woven hemp rope pillows. These pillows are called fenders. And in order not to damage the sides of another ship with anchors in a collision, the niches of the bow anchor hawsers of the tug protrude so deeply into the hull that the pores of the anchors are completely hidden in them. If the tug has to work in ice, it has one more feature. This is an ice-breaking shape of the bow and stern and strong reinforcements of the hull, especially in its bow. How does a tugboat lead other ships? To do this, he has a special towing device. The towing rope is attached to a hook installed as close as possible to the middle of the tug. With this attachment, the agility of the tugboat is better when it is guiding the vessel. The hook has a special latch so that the rope does not give up on its own. And so that the towing rope, especially when turning, does not cling to anything and does not threaten people, several high arches are placed in the stern. A rope slides over them. In addition to port, there are even more powerful, sea and ocean tugs. The oceanic one differs from the marine one only in the large size of the hull and the power of the mechanisms. Sea tugs carry barges or other vessels by sea from one port to another. Sometimes you have to drive huge cigar-shaped rafts. Several thousand cubic meters of timber are tied into such rafts. The displacement of the sea tug is 300 to 500 tons, and the power of its mechanisms is up to 1500 horsepower. Such a tug can sail at sea for 25 to 30 days without the need for resupply. And during this time, the weather in the sea can be different, from a dead calm to a raging storm. Therefore, the tug is well suited for sailing in stormy weather. Yes, and in appearance it is very different from the port. The sea tug has a bow superstructure, an elevated forecastle, and it is much longer than that of all ordinary merchant ships, sometimes occupying more than half the length of the tug. With such a tank, it is easier for him to climb the wave, the deck is less flooded with water. Below the forecastle deck, many living and service spaces can be accommodated. There is no special need for such premises on a port tug. Here the team consists of several people, and even those, having served their shift, go home to rest. Another thing is in a sea tug. Its crew reaches 40 people. For them, the tugboat is their home. They need cabins, and a dining room, and a resting place, and other household premises. Lifeboats are installed on the superstructure deck. Above the superstructure is the captain's bridge, where the latest control devices and a fairly powerful radio station are concentrated. Recently, a sea tug has a wonderful device in order to take a towing line from a steamer in any storm. Here is a ship in distress on the high seas. And at sea, a terrible ten-point storm. Steep waves prevent the tugboat from approaching the emergency steamer. Then the tug captain takes a special gun and loads it with a rocket, to which a thin cable is attached, a line. The trigger is pulled and the luminous rocket flies towards the steamer. And behind it stretches a line up to 400 meters long. The rocket and the end of the line fall on the deck of the ship. And its other end remains in tow. The sailors of the ship are attaching a towing rope to the line. The emergency ship taken in tow is taken to the nearest port. A sea tug has to drive several barges or other vessels into the sea. Such a caravan stretches for hundreds of meters. A sea tug leads ships on a longer rope than a port tug. The length of this rope is up to 300 meters. Working with such a long rope requires a lot of skill and dexterity from the team. Here another special device comes to the rescue, an automatic towing winch. One has only to pull the rope to the danger of breaking, as the mechanism itself will turn on the winch and it will release the rope. If the tow line is too loose, the same mechanism will cause the winch to pull it back up to normal tension. There is also a special type of tug. This is a rescue tug. His duty is not only to tow the emergency vessel, but also to provide him with urgent assistance at the scene of the accident. The rescue tug rushes to the rescue. The displacement of such a tug is even greater, and the power of the mechanisms reaches 4000 horsepower. The towing and rescue vessel is most often equipped with a diesel-electric installation. Electric energy is produced here as much as it is needed for the whole plant. 
This is because, in addition to its main consumer, the propeller, such eaters of electric current are installed on the ship, which you will not find on ordinary merchant ships. Here are two hydraulic monitors in the bow of the rescuer, similar to a short-barreled cannon with a gun carriage. They are called so, fire monitors. They deliver water jets far and high under enormous pressure. In addition to them, more than 10 fire hoses pour water onto the burning ship. And how much electric current is eaten up by powerful sump pumps? In an hour, each of them can pump out up to 1,000 tons of water from the compartment of the emergency ship. A lot of electricity is spent on the operation of fire pumps and other fire fighting equipment, powerful winches and cranes, and on the production of compressed air. A lot of electrical energy is consumed by the searchlights of the ship, which will illuminate the crash site of the ocean giant. Finally, a very large current consumer is a mechanical repair shop. Here, the current is needed for the rotation of machines and electric welding. In the workshop, parts of the mechanisms and devices of the wrecked vessel are repaired and remanufactured. Just in case, rescue equipment is always stored in the vast hold of the tug and rescue vessel, plasters for sealing holes, diving accessories, cables of various sizes, barrels of cement, boards and canvas. And on the deck of the superstructure, in addition to lifeboats, there is a seaworthy motor boat. Towing and rescue ships can be found everywhere, with the exception of the seas of the harsh Arctic. Here their duties are performed by powerful icebreakers. Icebreaker, Russian invention. The autumn of 1864 in St. Petersburg was amazing. Rains were replaced by snowfalls. The Gulf of Finland was either covered with a thin crust of ice, or quickly cleared of the ice cover. Everyone grumbled, oh ah, well, the weather. Neither winter nor autumn. Some misfortune. The residents of Kronstadt had a particularly hard time. The population of the island was transported across the bay on steamboats during the warmer months. In winter, when the bay was covered with ice, a toboggan run was established between the island and the mainland. Now the ice was such that even the Kronstadters could not go, and no one came to see them. The inhabitants of the city completely lost heart, or what good, and you will have to starve. Here is the position. There seemed to be no way out. But there was a way out. He was found by the Kronstadt merchant and shipowner Britnev. He came up with a way that surprised the whole world. It all started with the fact that Britnev fell into the hands of one book. It told about how Russian people from ancient times tried to fight the ice. After all, many of our seas are completely or partially covered with ice during the winter months. This disrupts the normal life of areas adjacent to such seas. In the far east of our country, the northern part of the Sea of Japan, the coastal areas of the Sea of Okhotsk and the Bering Sea freeze in winter. For a long time, communication with Sakhalin, Kamchatka, the Okhotsk and Anadira coasts is terminated. The Gulf of Finland of the Baltic Sea freezes for the whole winter. For some time, such southern seas as the Sea of Azov and the northern part of the Caspian freeze over. Finally, due to ice, there are interruptions in the work of the Nikolaev, Hesorn and Odessa ports. The White Sea freezes for almost half a year. Communication along its coast is most often carried out on dogs or deer. As for the Arctic seas, the Kara, Luptev, East Siberian, Chukchi, they are covered with ice all year round. Swimming in them with great difficulty is only possible during the three summer months. Before, when there were no real means of fighting ice, navigation of ships stopped in the freezing seas and all life in the coastal regions came to a standstill. But people have been fighting ice for a long time. The inhabitants of the northern regions of our motherland, Pomus, used, for example, ice-breaking ferries in the 16th century, in which the shape of the nose was like a sleigh. These ferries were loaded with ice or stone. Ice-breaking ferries were loaded with ice or stones. Then people or horses dragged the ferries in the right direction. The beveled shape of the nose of the ferry allowed him to crawl out to the edge of the ice and crush it with his weight. Then the ferry was pulled further along the ice, and as a result, a water path was obtained for the passage of the ship. For such work, 200 to 250 people or 20 to 25 horses were required. The book also told about how Peter I, during the siege of Vibok by Russian troops in 1710, with the entire fleet made his way through the ice field of the Gulf of Finland. Further, it was said how, shortly after the voyage of the first Russian steamship Elizaveta, in the St. Petersburg magazine Son of the Fatherland, they published a whole article about the possibility of using steamboats in winter conditions. And 20 years later, in St. Petersburg, the Society for the Establishment of Ferry Steamers with and without an icebreaker saw mechanism was organized.
The inventor of one of these steamships was a military engineer, General Schilder. The society was bombarded then with various proposals for the fight against ice. Some suggested installing a circular saw at the bow of the ferry to cut through the ice. Such a saw was supposed to operate from the engine of the steamer. Others attach a strong wooden battering ram to the bow of the steamer to help break up the ice. Some idle inventor came up with the idea of installing a device similar to the mouth of a shark in the bow of the steamer. The lower part of the mouth was supposed to have iron teeth like plowshares. With these teeth, the ice would be crushed into small pieces and then thrown out through special pipes. But all these curious inventions did not make an icebreaker out of the steamer. Some other device was needed to overcome the ice. Britniv read the book, and he had a brilliant idea. Isn't it possible to arrange a steamship in the same way as icebreaking ferries? Icebreaking ferries were dragged onto the ice by horses, and a steamship can do without any outside help. But for this it is necessary to cut the bow of the steamer with such a slope that it does not rest against the ice, but climbs on it and breaks this ice with its weight. Moreover, the bow of the ship must be made strong and heavy. To do this, you just need to install additional parts of the hull set here and make the skin thicker. And in order to further weight the bow of the steamer, it is necessary to shield the tank there. And, when necessary, pump water into this tank. Britniv did all this on his ship pilot. The world's first icebreaker pilot. The steamer was able to maintain communication between Kronstadt and the mainland for several more weeks, breaking the fragile ice. This is how the world's first icebreaker appeared. And when the ice became strong, the pilot was replaced by sleds. A year later, Britniv built a special icebreaker, boy. The news of the remarkable invention of the Kronstadt merchant spread throughout the world. And a few years later, foreigners had to turn to Britniv for help. It happened like this. The winter of 1871 in Western Europe was very severe. Suddenly, the bay of the German port of Hamburg froze over, although it had never frozen before. Dozens of huge ocean-going steamships are firmly frozen into the ice. They were doomed to inactivity throughout the winter. Not a single steamer could enter the port. Stopping the port threatened millions in losses. What to do? It was then that they remembered Britnev and his ice-breaking ships. Soon uninvited guests came to Kronstadt. Three German engineers came to Britnev. They persuaded the merchant to sell them the secret of his invention. And Britniv gave the drawings to the Germans for 300 rubles. According to these drawings, the Germans built the icebreaker icebreaker. Then icebreakers began to be built in the USA, Finland, Sweden and other countries. But nowhere, even in Russia, was it said that the icebreaker was a Russian invention. By the end of the last century, different countries had built about 40 icebreakers. Among them there was not a single such powerful linear icebreaker that could overcome the thick ice of the Arctic. The world's first Arctic icebreaker has again appeared in our country. Its creator was Admiral Stepan Osipovich Makarov. At that time, scientists and researchers from various countries passionately rushed into the unexplored depths of the Arctic. The cherished dream of everyone was to raise the flag of their homeland at the North Pole. Nothing kept people in this aspiration, and neither failures, nor terrible hardships, nor possible death. A rare expedition returned safely from an unsuccessful trip to the North Pole. The main obstacle was the impenetrable ice of the Arctic. What means did not people use to get through these ice? And sleds in dog sleds, and ordinary steamboats, and balloons. Admiral Makarov believed that the only way to reach the North Pole was with the help of a powerful icebreaker. To the North Pole, ahead. This is how Makarov called his lecture, in which he argued in 1897 that it was necessary to get to the North Pole only by icebreaker. With the help of the icebreaker, Makarov also intended to explore the basin of the entire Arctic Ocean and organize normal navigation along it. Here is what Admiral Makarov said in his lecture. By nature itself, Russia has been placed in exceptional conditions. Almost all of its seas freeze in winter, and the Arctic Ocean is covered with ice in the summer. If we compare Russia with a building, then the facade of such a building overlooks the Arctic Ocean. The main rivers of Siberia flow there, and all the country's sails could go there. If the Arctic Ocean were open to navigation, it would bring great economic benefits. Now the Arctic Ocean is closed, but is it possible to open it artificially, with the help of icebreakers? Makarov endured many ordeals before he managed to build an icebreaker. We needed money. But no one gave money. 
wherever he turned, to the Tsarist ministers, and to the Russian Academy of Sciences, and to individual rich people. Everywhere he was politely listened to, the idea was approved, but the money was denied. He tried to captivate his closest boss with his idea, the Minister of the Navy, Admiral Tertov. Here is what this official in Admiral's uniform wrote on Makarov's project. Perhaps the idea of Admiral Makarov is feasible, but since, in my opinion, it can in no way serve the benefit of the fleet, the naval ministry cannot assist the Admiral either with money, or, even more so, with ready-made ships, with which the Russian the Navy is not rich enough to donate them to scientists. But Makarov, with great perseverance and perseverance, achieved his goal. Makarov was greatly supported by the great Russian scientist Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev. In the Arctic Ocean, wrote Mendeleev, future Russia must find its own way out. If we have defeated the strongholds of the mountains, we must also overcome the ice. And near the ice there is a lot of gold and all sorts of other good things. In his project to conquer the ice of the Arctic with the help of an icebreaker, Mendeleev argued that such a conquest is necessary for the prosperity of the entire north of our motherland. To facilitate the passage of the icebreaker through the ice, Mendeleev proposed to blow them up with liquid air mixed with coal. In the end, Makarov won, the money for the construction of the icebreaker was released from the royal treasury. It is difficult now to say what made the dumb-headed ministers of Tsarist Russia give in to Makarov. Maybe it's just the greed of the capitalists who dream of predatory use of the natural resources of our north, or perhaps the threat of war between Russia and Japan. The shortest route across the Arctic Ocean to the far eastern shores of our country seemed very tempting. How good it would be to transfer the battle fleet of the Baltic Sea to the far east in this way, one way or another, but the construction of the icebreaker began. Admiral Makarov worked hard on his project. He brought a lot of new things to the icebreaker project. The Arctic is not the Gulf of Finland. Here, the ice will compress the sides of the icebreaker so much that only a wet place will remain of it. Makarov foresaw this. He gave the hull of the icebreaker the shape of an egg. To make the sides stronger, they put a double number of frames, and the wide sheathing belt at the load waterline, the ice belt, was doubled in thickness. The deadly embrace of ice with such a strong body is no longer so terrible. To be sure that the icebreaker would not sink from an accidental hole when it hit an ice floe, Makarov did many experiments with a zinc model of an icebreaker, checking the location of the bulkheads. He tested this model in the bath of his admiral's cabin on the ship. At the same time, Alexei Nikolovich Krylov was testing a paraffin model of an icebreaker in the experimental basin. The test results agreed with all calculations. Makarov was confident that the icebreaker would be able to withstand the most difficult working conditions in the ice. This is how it actually happened. In October 1898, the world's first powerful Arctic icebreaker was launched. They called him Ermak. In February of the following year, Yermak went on trial to the Gulf of Finland. Ermak went on trial. At that time there was especially strong ice in the bay. But it crumbled easily and parted under the onslaught of the icebreaker. Just not far from the port of Revel, now Tallinn, 13 ships got stuck in the ice. They had a long winter ahead of them. An ordinary icebreaker, city of Revel, was sent to help the steamers. He made his way to the steamers, but then he himself became a prisoner of the ice. I had to send Ermak to the rescue. Soon the icebreaker brought all 14 ships to Revel. Residents of the city gave the icebreaker a solemn welcome. And after some time, Ermak was successfully tested in the harsh ice of the Arctic. The fame of the new Russian icebreaker thundered all over the world. Newspapers and magazines of all countries for a long time published pictures of the Yermak, portraits of Admiral Makarov, descriptions of his life and work. More than 50 years have passed since then. About 4,000 ships spent during this time Ermak. During the war years, he fulfilled his duty by shelling and bombing, helping warships. And now he honestly serves our motherland. The world's most powerful icebreaking fleet of the USSR was created on its model, how an icebreaker conquers the ice. The work of the icebreaker is diverse. What does he not have to do? He leads through the ice of the frozen seas caravans of cargo ships. It helps hunting and fishing vessels to trade in the polar seas. The icebreaker selflessly makes its way to ships in distress in the ice, helps them get rid of the ice hugs and tows them to the nearest port. It makes it possible for Soviet scientists to study the nature of still unexplored places in the Arctic. Here the icebreaker turns into a real research institute. 
On it, scientists find well-equipped laboratories and all kinds of instruments. And in all cases, the icebreaker has one single enemy, ice. To successfully fight such an enemy, the icebreaker climbs the ice with a run and breaks it with the weight of the bow. And the weight is great. It reaches 1,000 to 1,500 tons. Where does this heaviness come from? To answer this question, let's remember how a person feels when bathing in a bath. You immediately ask, what does the bath have to do with the icebreaker? But what? When you sit in a bath filled with water, your body feels light. And when the water from the bath decreases, you feel how your body becomes heavier, regaining the weight lost in the water. Again, Archimedes' law applies here. The same thing happens with the icebreaker. When its bow climbs onto the ice, it fully regains its weight. And then the weight of the water pumped into the bow tank is added. This is how the huge weight of the bow of the icebreaker is obtained. Of course, if the ice is fragile, it will already part under the onslaught of the icebreaker. And the ship, although slowly, but continuously moves forward, making a channel in the ice. But it often happens that the icebreaker has to retreat back 200 to 300 meters and then run into the ice like an angry beast. Sometimes this is repeated for many hours in a row. In the end, the ice cannot withstand this crushing force. Propellers, sometimes installed in the bow, strongly help some icebreakers. For example, the icebreaker Captain Belusov has four propellers, a two in the stern and two in the bow. These bow propellers improve the agility of icebreakers, reduce ice pressure on the hull and make it easier to break the ice field. A small icebreaker without nose propellers feels especially bad when you have to overcome small broken ice or compressed ice porridge. And the nose propellers create a powerful eroding wave, break the porridge with a wave and clear the way. But, of course, an icebreaker, when working in heavy ice, would quickly break off such propellers. Therefore, linear arctic icebreakers do not have them. Sometimes they come across such thick and cohesive ice that there are such cases, an icebreaker climbs onto an ice floe, but it does not break through, it only settles down. And the icebreaker sits down on the ice, like on a big pillow. His body is clamped on both sides, and he gets stuck, held by ice. The icebreaker can no longer budge, although the machines are working at full speed. The icebreaker cannot move. We must somehow free ourselves from the mighty embrace. But how? First, the healing method is used. For this, the icebreaker has heal tanks. They stretch along the sides in the middle of the ship. They are separated from the interior by a longitudinal bulkhead, so that they form, as it were, a double board located between the bottom of the ship and the lower deck. Usually boiler water and liquid fuel are stored in such tanks. They have another duty, and to protect the ship in case of damage to the outer side. But how do roll tanks help an icebreaker in his trouble? Have you ever watched a heavy boat being pulled from the shore into the water? If it does not give in to the efforts of people, it is rocked from side to side and at the same time pushed forward. This is what they do with an icebreaker stuck in the ice. Water is quickly pumped from the roll tanks of one side to the tanks of the other side, and back. From this, the icebreaker begins to rock from side to side. Water is quickly pumped from one tank to another, rocking the icebreaker. Then it is no longer difficult for him to get off the ice back, working machines at full speed. If such a remedy does not help, they resort to the help of ice one-horned anchors. An ice anchor is laid with a horn in a recess made in the ice behind the stern of the vessel. Then a thick steel cable attached to the anchor is wound onto the drum of the aft capstan. At the same time, the icebreaker is tilted on one side and water is taken into the stern tank so that it sits deeper as a stern. When everything is ready, the machines of the icebreaker are given full speed back, and at this time the capstan selects the anchor cable. Thus, the machines receive tangible help to move the icebreaker back. Sometimes even that kind of help is useless. Then they decide on an extreme measure, and they use an explosive, most often aminal. To do this, at the bow of the icebreaker, 10 to 12 meters from the side, a hole is drilled in the ice so deep that it reaches almost to the lower edge of the ice. An explosive charge is lowered into this hole. Then the simultaneous operation of all the machines of the icebreaker in full reverse and the shaking of the ice from the explosion can well help the jammed ship. As you can see, the release of an icebreaker stuck in the ice is a troublesome and painstaking task. It takes a lot of time. The icebreaker Ermac somehow managed to get stuck in the ice 20 times in two days of work in the Gulf of Finland. During this time, he could not budge for a total of 18 hours. 
and there is no need to talk about the ice of the Arctic. There, the process is even slower. One or two knots, that's how fast an icebreaker sometimes moves in the ice fields of the Arctic. It takes a lot of time for an icebreaker to guide a caravan of cargo ships through the ice. Vessels go through the channel, laid in the ice by an icebreaker. If the ice is weak, and the ships have a fairly strong hull and powerful machines, then the caravan is made up of four or more steamers. In heavy ice, the number of ships is reduced to two or even one. After all, when the ice field is compressed, the channel laid by the icebreaker is quickly filled with ice. Therefore, it is better for an icebreaker to lead a small number of ships than to waste time on frequent returns to free and tow ships at the end of the caravan. While the icebreaker is towing one ship, the rest patiently stand still. Towing is carried out in different ways, with the help of a long steel cable or with a shackle close, when the stem of the steamer rests against a recess in the stern of the icebreaker. Here, even some benefit for the icebreaker is obtained, the steamer, working with its machine, presses on the icebreaker, helping it overcome the ice. Sometimes ice causes great trouble to cargo ships, a holes and large dents in the outer skin, breakage of propeller blades and parts of the steering gear. In this case, the icebreaker will always have funds to help the injured ship. It has powerful sump pumps that can pump over 10,000 tons of water per hour from a wrecked ship. In addition, there are portable pumps. To seal the holes in the hull, the icebreaker has a sufficient amount of canvas to bring a temporary plaster, cement, bags, felt and other emergency supplies. There are also several divers on the icebreaker. So the icebreaker can pump water out of the damaged vessel, help it close the hole, fix the passage of seawater, change the broken propeller blades and make any minor repairs. When an icebreaker makes its way through the ice, it moves mostly in alternating strokes. Once, during the Arctic voyage of the Krasan icebreaker, it was calculated that in four hours of work it changed forward to reverse 200 times and back. Therefore, it is better for an icebreaker to have engines that are well suited for quick changes in speed and long work in reverse. This is where the advantages of the electric ship over other ships are most clearly revealed. An electric icebreaker has a very easy and quick change of course by switching the direction of the electric current. He has the ability to work in reverse at full power. Such an icebreaker can be controlled directly from the bridge, which is very important for the successful maneuvering of the vessel in ice. In addition to icebreakers, ice cutters are involved in the fight against ice. Ice cutters are mainly used to work in broken ice. They sometimes have to overcome solid ice, but not particularly strong and cohesive. Unlike icebreakers, the icebreaker does not break the ice, crushing it with the weight of its bow. It acts by blowing the stem against the ice edge, pushing individual ice flows apart to the sides. Who has not heard of the wonderful Soviet ice cutter Litka? You, of course, know that the first ship to pass the northern sea route from west to east in one navigation was the icebreaker Sibiryakov. This was in 1932, and the Litki ice cutter is the first ship that passed in one navigation from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic. Soviet ice cutter, Litki. July 28, 1934, Litki left Vladivostok. On the way, in the Laptev Sea, he freed several ships from ice captivity. It was difficult for an ice cutter not adapted for such work to break through the one and a half meter ice to these vessels. In a stubborn struggle with ice, every meter was won back. The last five miles separating the ice cutter from the steamers were covered in five days, one mile per day. In the end, the ice cutter brought the steamers to clean water. And then, at the mouth of the Yenisei River, the Litki made another rescue operation, removing the English steamer from the shallows. Only three months later, the Litki moored at the birth of the Murmansk port. It was one of the brightest episodes in the development of the North by Soviet polar explorers, and already, starting from 1935, the regular navigation of Soviet ships along the Northern Sea route in both directions began, from east to west and from west to east. The previously inaccessible Arctic, the grave of many brave explorers and sailors, is becoming one of the waterways of the Soviet Union. Today, polar explorers receive new, most powerful equipment for the final transformation of the Northern Sea Route into a normally operating, open not only in summer, but all year round, sea route. Fulfilling the decisions of the Communist Party, Soviet scientists, engineers and workers create a wonderful ship, the flagship of the USSR ice fleet, the world's first nuclear-powered icebreaker, which bears the name of the Great Lenin. Nuclear Icebreaker. July 1960 at the pier is a huge, beautiful icebreaker. In the rays of the polar sun, its streamlined superstructure sparkles with whiteness. The big chimney is not visible. A low forward mast, slightly tilted back, rises above the ship. 
It carries navigation lights, searchlights, observation posts and antennas, and inside it is a channel for ventilation of the interior. A hangar is visible in the stern of the icebreaker. It houses two helicopters. There is also a small platform for the takeoff and landing on the deck. A helicopter is the eye of an icebreaker in the icy expanses of the Arctic. It makes the icebreaker sighted for many hundreds of kilometers around. Previously, for ice reconnaissance and communication with the ships of the caravan, the icebreaker had a seaplane. Then he was removed. Too often he was a useless, bulky load for the icebreaker. When the plane went on reconnaissance, it was either fired from a special catapult, or lowered by a crane overboard the icebreaker into clean water. And when they returned, they lifted them onto the deck in the same way. This operation was long and inconvenient, and surrounded by ice and impossible. Another thing is a helicopter. He immediately takes off from the vessel up, vertically, and also smoothly sits down on a small section of the deck. And what are these devices that look like well cranes that rise in the bow of the icebreaker? It turns out that these are two powerful hydromonitors. They are capable of ejecting tens of thousands of tons of water under pressure of several hundred atmospheres from the narrow openings of the trunks. Like two huge axes, sparkling streams of water, surrounded by clouds of steam, will crash into the ice. Before such jets, the thickest ice in the Arctic will not resist and split like a log. It will not be difficult for this icebreaker to pave the way through the thickest ice, using the weight of the hull and the power of engines with a capacity of 44,000 horsepower. Meanwhile, the power of all the steam engines of our ordinary icebreaker does not exceed 10,000 horsepower. For the operation of these machines, nine huge steam boilers and several large compartments, bunkers for coal were needed. The bunkers held up to 3,000 tons of coal. This fuel supply was enough for the icebreaker for a month of continuous navigation, 100 tons per day. The boiler of a nuclear icebreaker consumes only a few tens of grams of fuel per day. Therefore, the entire supply of it can be placed in a small room. But if you walked on coal, then for the annual supply of fuel it would be necessary to build a bunker of fantastic size, with a capacity of 300,000 tons. But the entire displacement of the Lennon icebreaker is about 16,000 tons. Instead of coal bunkers, cargo holds are equipped inside the new icebreaker. Now the icebreaker will not only break through any ice, but also carry a large amount of cargo itself. For one flight without replenishment of supplies, he could make six round-the-world trips in a row. Scheme of the nuclear icebreaker. In the stern of the icebreaker there are propeller engine compartments. There are three electric motors that rotate three propellers. They give the icebreaker a speed of 18 knots. Electric motors receive current for their movement through wires from the main power plant located in the middle of the ship. Here, electric generators are rotated by powerful steam turbines. This is the engine room of the icebreaker. Two more turbo generators, but smaller in size, are also installed here. This is an auxiliary power plant that powers all auxiliary machinery and appliances, the galley, the bakery and the lighting network. And the energy for all the turbines of the main and auxiliary power plants is provided by a nuclear boiler. It is located next to the engine room and is fenced on all sides with concrete protection. The gamma rays emitted by an atomic boiler, like gasoline vapors on a tanker, are very persistent. Having accidentally jumped out of the atomic boiler along with radioactive material, they can climb into the premises of neighboring compartments. Even concrete protection cannot prevent such cases. For example, these rays can be emitted by water that has been inside an atomic boiler. There may be other reasons as well. Of course, the strength is no longer the same as in the atomic boiler. But still, they can cause harm to health. That is why special devices, dosimeters, hang at the central post and in the compartments of the icebreaker. They check whether harmful radiation of radioactive substances enters the premises, nuclear icebreaker in the ice. And there are so many rooms, large and small, on the ship that you can't go around in a day, about 900. Perhaps the most interesting thing is in the central control room. If the nuclear boiler is the heart of the icebreaker's power plant, then the central control post is its brain. Let's open the massive door and enter the cabin of the central post. At the entrance, you are amazed by the abundance of automatic devices, dials, self-recording devices, signal lights flashing in different colors. From here they control a nuclear chain reaction in an atomic boiler. From here, strict control is exercised over the supply of steam to the turbines, over the operation of the turbo generators. 
From time to time, the watch operator presses a button, lowers a lever, or gives a low-pitched command into the handset. Flashes of light bulbs and luminous inscriptions report to the operator about all the details of the chain reaction. Entire bundles of flexible wires go from the cabin to the nuclear boiler. These wires connect its devices with the mechanisms and devices of the central post. There are many instruments in the cockpit that regulate the movement of water in a nuclear boiler and reflect the properties of the resulting steam, its pressure, temperature and flow rate. There are many such devices that automatically regulate the operation of steam turbines, water pumps, heat exchangers, generators, and all electrical mechanisms of the icebreaker. Only the operation of the propulsion motors themselves is not controlled by the power engineer from the cabin of the post. This is done from the command room on the bridge. Here, at the touch of a button, electric motors are started and stopped, give a small, medium and full speed. Centrifugal pumps of hydraulic monitors are also launched from here. Electric autopilots installed in the command cabin accurately guide the icebreaker along a given course. Radar and hydroacoustic devices signal to the watch navigator about the appearance of various obstacles above and below water, ice mountains, underwater rocks and oncoming ships. Automatic devices immediately force the icebreaker to bypass these obstacles. All this involuntarily resembles the work of an aircraft device, an autopilot. As you know, with the help of an autopilot, the pilot maintains the course of the aircraft without interfering with the control of its flight. The watch navigator of the icebreaker is in exactly the same position. Now, in those days when this book is being printed, the icebreaker is still being completed at one of the Leningrad shipyards. But the day is not far off when the first nuclear-powered ship will set sail. The creative work of the scientists, engineers and workers who created this wonderful ship will force the mighty atomic energy to obediently serve the interests of our Soviet people. Application The largest ships in the world Location of residential and service premises on a large cargo passenger turboelectric ship 1. Upper Command Bridge, E2, Chimney, E3, Wheelhouse, 4, Navigation Cabin, 5, Captain's Cabin, e B, Radio Room, 7, Sports Ground, 8, Swimming Pool and Solarium, e 9, Shower, Locker Room, 10, Cinema Hall, 11, Cabin Command Staff, 12, Children's Cabin, 13, Open Part of the Promenade Deck, 14, Salon Veranda, 16, Reading Room and Library, 16, Ladders and elevators for communication between decks, 17, passenger cabins, 18, living quarters of the team, 19, elevator for supplying. Provisions to the galley, 20, galley, ship's kitchen, 21, bakery, 22, infirmary, 23, restaurant, 24, ship pantry, paints, ropes, tarpaulins, blocks, and a carpenter's workshop, 26, side hatch for the entrance of passengers, acceptance of small cargo and vehicles, 26, liquid fuel tanks for boilers, 27, boiler room, 28, department of turbo generators, 29, mechanical workshop, 30, auxiliary diesel generator for electric lighting, 31, climatic station for air conditioning, 32, provisional pantry and refrigerator, 33, cargo holds, 34, the placement of the steering machine, 36, after peak, aft ballast tank, 36, the room of the propulsion motor, one of the two, 37, laundry, 38, mail, 39, four picnos ballast tank, 40, double bottom space, used to store liquid fuel, lubricating oil, ballast water, fresh water for boilers, 41, compartment for log and echo sounder, 42, foremast, 43, cargo crane, 44, direction finder antenna, 46, radar antenna, 46, ship, radio antenna, 47, main mast, Thank you for downloading the book from the free electronic library royallib.com, https colon double forward slash royallib.com. Leave a review about the book, https colon double forward slash royallib.com forward slash comment forward slash bulgarov underscore nikolay forward slash parahod.html. All books by the author, https colon double forward slash royallib.com forward slash author forward slash bulgarov underscore nikolay.html.